to episode 38 of I Got Gameplay. Yes, it is me, I have returned, your lord and saviour, Mr. Michael Burhan. And tonight on the show, we instead of the current lineup, as you know in wrestling and everything else, card subject to change, we have the originally scheduled host, Mr. Travis Goss. Travis! <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> It's brilliant. I love that. And we also have a special guest tonight who decided to come on the show and join us because I really begged him. Mr. Christopher Jace. Hey, 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 I will do anything to back the Bring Back Crash Bandicoot campaign. <laughs> Bring it back. <laughs> Bring it back. Yes, and uh, we're going a little bit off topic today because I want to talk about something rather quickly before we go into the new session. And we're kind of stealing something which is commonplace for the Dace Man show, so you check that that show out, guys. And of course, it is the douchebag of the week. You're a douchebag. Douchebag. You don't feel insulted the fact that I actually use that, do you, Dace? No, that is a great song. <laughs> <laughs> well, today I want to talk about somebody who's gotten on my nerves in terms of you know someone who alleges that they're a gamer and did a photo of themselves in front of a bloody Nintendo Entertainment System. Someone who basically calls herself an uber-feminist and a pulp, pop culture critic. And that person has a name. Her name is Anita Sarkeesian. Now, she's done this whole Trops versus Women videos, uh, which she did a Kickstarter campaign, which lasted over a year, and literally got 150 thousand dollars I'm not even kidding you people a hundred and fifty thousand dollars from feminists around the world and people who felt like shit so they gave her the money because they thought that she was going to do research and independent analysis on gaming and talk about the the whole feminism in gaming and it's something you know I I'm an actor I studied theatre theory so I understand the whole feminism issue and I understand how it's allowed women to excel, to go in strides. You know, the women's suffrage campaign, It women have gone come so far, but this blatant insult of a video that she put out on games, such as Mario, saying how Mario, apparently, has to save the princess. That, apparently, the princess always keeps getting herself in trouble and can't defend herself against the big bad Bowser that Mario has to keep going saving her. She was talking about the fact how gaming icons, you know, she doesn't even touch much on uh, Samus from Metroid. She doesn't talk about Lara Croft and how much of a hero Lara Croft is. And if you look at the Tomb Raider game and the fact that she actually, like, you know, stabbed the guy in his balls, yeah, she doesn't talk about any of that. She talks about the fact how apparently game developers make women weak. Now, I want to throw it onto the panel here. So let's start off with you, Dace. Do you think she has a point? Do game developers make women weak absolutely not like you said with Lara Croft uh, Samus and uh, even if you go Lollipop Chains even though she was a ditzy blonde she still kicked ass and the dude was clearly the bitch in that game because he was only a head Um, I can't see why you would attack games like that there there are several games out there with lead female character uh, characters and you know stop get the sand out of your vagina I don't know why you're going after like (laughs) Gaming in general. You don't like games where the guys are the lead characters? Don't buy them. Stop pushing your opinion on other people, you dumb bitch. But you know what really got on my nerves is the fact that she went on CNN and she was wearing her little business suit and her big hoop earrings talking about the fact that how gaming is a man's world and men don't, do not want her to expose it. And she's talking about the fact that these videos that she's putting out on YouTube are going to be used as school material, uh, as something, as point of reference for children at school. And I'm sorry, but that is a big bunch. It's a steaming pile of bullshit. Yeah, well, that's like us going on the news and saying, look, Victoria's Secret is, like, totally geared towards women. Why can't I wear those panties? I mean, come on. The gaming industry is for dudes. Girls don't, majority of girls don't like playing those type of games. You know what they play? They play Little Big Planet, and they play stupid things like Candy Crush. That's what girls do. Okay, there are some several girls out there that do play, but they don't bitch that the lead character is a dude. It's it's ridiculous for you to sit there and call yourself a gamer and bitch about the way a design is. It's it, her name's Anita, right? Yes. She needs to get a life. Anita get a life. 
But the thing that really bugs me as well, as I said, she talks about the fact that Mario is a character that she loves and that she's well loved and immersed in all these these characters. And I, and I just want to point out on the fact that this woman bastardized every single game. She's even talking about Bayonetta and saying how Bayonetta has her legs wide open, even though she's a very dominant uh, protagonist in this game. And, you know, Bayonetta is literally... She kicks ass through the entire game, but apparently she's submissive towards the men's, you know, idealisms of what women should be with the big boobs and the big legs and the fact that she gets naked and throws her hair around everywhere. It's like she pulled a lot of her point of references as well off Wikipedia. And this is another thing that pissed me off. You are saying you're doing in-depth research on something, but you pulled your shit off Wikipedia. And I've said this on my YouTube vids, and I'm going to say this again. Yuri of the Wind, this guy has done a thing called Gaming Mysteries. I'm going to plug him at the moment. YouTube.com, Yuri of the Wind. Check it out, guys. He does a huge in-depth analysis in games, and he doesn't take a penny from people. All he gets is his views. That's it. He does a better freaking research and analysis than Anita did. And the fact that she was talking about a, a thing called Dinosaur Planet as well, What's up, Internet Wrestling Community? This is Anthony Mango of SmartOutMoment.com, a wrestling website dedicated to the smart marks like you and I. We break down and review every pay-per-view with predictions and spoilers, and you can catch our weekly podcast on YouTube for some smack talk. There's no rules here, and we show no mercy. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at SmartOutMoment, where we analyze all the angles, shoot first, and kill kayfabe. That's www.smarkoutmoment.com. Why mark out when you can smark out? And it's just, oh. Uh, she was talking about how the fact there was a strong female protagonist in Dinosaur Planet, and when they switched it to Star Fox, and she became a damsel in distress in the game, people didn't like that, and yada, 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 yada. The, the whole point about this, which really frustrates me, is that she did no research on the subject at all. Now, let me just point it over to one of our other co-hosts here, Sean Walker. He's just came back. Sean, welcome to the show. And vent a little bit about Anita, because I know that you felt really strongly about this. Ah, oh, this whole... Ah, oh, this whole was... was mad, man. She was off a bloody rock, I I, I play, play video games, and apparently men who play video games are violent towards their spouses. No. Oh God! Just, 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 just no. That's like that's like saying playing video games is going to make me go out and buy a gun and shoot everybody. No, I don't know about you, but I shoot fireballs at my uh, female guests, just like I'm Mario. <laughs> no. Fireballs or sperm balls? The, the only thing I come close to doing is throwing a banana peel out of my car window. <laughs> that's, that's because I don't want trash in my fucking car. <laughs> no one fruit flies. We're doing ourselves a favor, so just don't drive over the banana peel, and then you won't crash. Exactly, and I'm positive that's an urban myth. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to go kid to fill. No, no, I agree. With, I totally agree with you, Sean, on this. This is this really bugs me about this as well. It's like you're she's going out saying all this shit, and she's troll baiting. And this is what the anchor in CNN actually said. You're troll baiting. You're feeding the trolls. You're saying all this shit about how men are getting offensive. Of course people are going to get offended by this. You're sitting there trashing what they love and you're not even doing it with, uh, with like, concurrent research. You know? And this is what bugs me uh, about this whole situation. And, uh, well, just turn it over to Travis now. Travis, what's your feelings on this? Have you, have you seen the videos? Damsel in Distress? I think I believe part two is now out. Part two and part three. I just can't believe this. I mean, oh my gosh. I mean, this this goes all the way back to. I mean, people were saying the same thing about movies and TV shows. It's, they just want to. That's what troubles me about the internet is people have used uh, the World Wide Web as their way to bitch about the dumbest things. And for her to go on YouTube and first of all. I don't know who gave her money, but he fucking idiots. But the point is, she did something so damn stupid when it was pointless beyond anything. I mean, let's look at it this way. Yeah, Prince, uh, 
princess is always uh, being captured, okay? Duh. That's happening in so many fairy tales, okay? So many movies, so many TV shows. I mean, it's just that it's, it's always there. And for someone to actually go online to say, well, this is, you know, this is wrong. I mean, they're, they're making women look weak. Um, you know, I'm sorry, but the fact of the matter is, this has gone on in other mediums. And for you to bitch about it in video games, I think you need a smack upside of your head. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, this is the, the thing. She's doing it on purpose. She's of course she is. She's doing it to lead people in on this. And this is what really bugs me as well. You know what? If I did a Kickstarter campaign, I will guarantee you that no one will donate. And it's because of the fact... <laughs> I, I love you, Dace. Bashing feminists in gaming. <laughs> right, that's how I roll. <laughs> <laughs> but literally, you know, we've got two co-hosts here as well, Nikki and Sam, who basically play games. And they could trump probably most of us dudes here, I know Sam could probably kill me at any FPS shooter, but what, you know, I digress. Well, I'm talking about the fact that if I did a Kickstarter, no one would donate. And the reason why no one would donate is because no one would give a shit about my project. And the moment someone says a buzzword like, you know, I'm going to do in-depth research and talk about feminist views, and because she's seen as such a pop culture critic, you know, that's what bugs me. I mean, and the thing too is you mentioned some of these other games where women are the main protagonists. Um, do you guys remember Blood Rain? Yes. And, of course, you touch on Bayonetta. While there are some female um, protagonists, there are also major uh, sexual role models at the same time. Yes. And that's how they're designed. So, I mean, I mean, there's always, there's always going to be two sides to every argument, but the one that she's putting out has no merit. I'm sorry. Yeah, because you're looking at it at the moment, and it's, you're, you're looking at these characters, you're looking at... Um, the fact that these are role models, you know, um, women in games are, the, most of these are developed by Japanese developers. People in, they're, they're a very different culture towards ours as well, because it's, you know, um, it's a different society in, in a sense. And it's not the fact that they're saying women are this or women should be viewed as that. It's more the fact that because of the cultural differences, they look at women from a different viewpoint. And I never hear a Japanese woman sitting there telling me about feminist fucking rights. They, they will talk about the fact that, you know, that women are viewed um, as sexualized icons. And I think that's the, probably the word for it. Sexualized icons because they are these big and bold characters. You know, you look at Jill Valentine, for instance. Kicks on mm -hmm. the fucking ass. She's been through hell and back. And she's always been a protagonist in these games. She's even been the villain at one point. You know, what about um, Kerrigan from StarCraft? The whole yeah. fucking franchise is around her. There you go. Exactly. You, she doesn't point these guys out on how they're strong role models for gamers. Instead, she tries to plot, talk about how it's a men's world. And she doesn't even cite her references properly. And this is what bugs me. If you're going to do something on a medium such as gaming, don't be a fucking douchebag about it. Right, you've been paid 150 grand. I could do a lot with 150 grand. You know, Dace could do a fucking lot. I, I, he'll probably be sitting in his room masturbating and researching as much as he fucking can. <laughs> That's a lot of hookers and blow, man. There you go. <laughs> you know, in, in terms of that, Sean could easily like put something together. I the the videos that she does, I can do for free using a fucking handy cam, a mic, and basically a good video editing software it's not fucking rocket science you know you don't need 150k to put these videos together where you've pulled off all the fucking information from wikipedia and you're sitting there going on about the fact that this is supposed to be empowering for women and the thing that bugs me the most is that there are women impressionable women listening to this truck i have two daughters two daughters who are avid gamers they're going to be doing a set of videos on my youtube channel um, for Skylanders, talking about the Skylanders that they love and that they Aww. want to. They've been bugging me to do this. So I'm going to allow them to do this and, and get them to do it. They're going to be short videos, though, because of the fact that my YouTube channel's been taken um, down to 15 minutes. My unlimited video play is gone because of Nintendo, but I'm not even going into that now. <clears throat> they 
don't need a role model like Anita Sarkeesian. They don't need a role model like that because she's a rather negative, she's nihilistic, and she's one of these... I won't even call her a feminist. She's a troublemaker. And she's a troublemaker because she will sit there and she'll be a very good politician at quoting sources and bending the truth to her will to make it sound like she knows what she's talking about and that she's relevant. And God forbid any young woman out there that listens to this tribe and starts trying to defend this woman. Because I'll tell you something, you're supposed to be a role model. You're supposed to be someone who's a pop culture critic, someone who talks about things and is supposed to see it from two different perspectives and and uh, you know and you're supposed to give it proper analysis instead you put bog standard youtube videos out there you take people's money which you're probably smoking crack with it or selling it on blow or whatever the fuck you're doing it with probably buying yourself a new bloody penthouse for that money and it's not fucking fair anita sarkeesian you are the douchebag of the week do you know what this bitch needs Tinkleberg. That's what she needs. She needs a big fat <laughs> I love it when uh, we we go for the sound bites because I do this all the time on my show. If I can't find it in the damn list, I drag out the freaking word like I can, as long as I can. <laughs> <laughs> like you're the do du- douchebag. There it is. Click. <laughs> now, guys, let's go on to some happier news with IGGs. What's in the news this week? Yes, it's the news segment. It's on a happier note now because we're going to need to forget about talking about stupid douchebags. So, gentlemen, what is in the news this week? We'll start with you, Dave. You got any news for us? I'd say a no on that one for a bit, so we'll come back. We'll segue that to Dave in a minute. Travis, you got any news for us? Yes, uh, I know we've talked uh, a lot about Resident Evil here in the past few episodes, so it looks like the next Resident Evil is likely aimed at core fans, uh, says ex-Capcom Senior Vice President. And I'm pulling this from Joystick.com. Capcom has taken its cue from fan feedback for Resident Evil 6, and the next game in the series is likely to appeal more to the core fans, according to former Senior Vice President of Marketing, Michael Pattison. Speaking to MCV, while employed at Capcom, Pattison said the company took uh, took notice of calls for the series to focus on survival horror rather than attempt a broader scope. Quote, with Resident Evil 6 specifically, we probably put too much content in there. There were comments from consumers that said it felt bloated. Patterson told, uh, Patterson told MCV. The Leon missions went down very well, and because we did Resident Evil Re- uh, Revelations on 3DS, there was a cry out for us to focus our attention on survival horror rather than be too many things to all people. Well, they got that now. Yeah, and you'll find where we can go next will likely be more targeted at our core fan base. So I would love, love, love to see a game... That a Resident Evil game that I mean we talked about pro- uh, possibly rebooting the franchise. You could, but I'd rather be they continue on the series, but just ditch all this action shit and just go back to what Resident Evil was all about. I'm not saying let's have the controls be like they were before because you and I both agree that tank controls of the original games did feel a little disoriented, disorienting. So let's just I think they should just. Bring it back to you know how it was supposed to be. I agree with you on that one. And, and ladies and gentlemen, just to let you know, uh, I do apologise. Blog Talk Radio is kind of acting up a little bit because I can hear a little bit of lag when it comes to um, my co-host. So apologise for that, guys. Um, but yeah, no, I agree with you. Uh, Dace, what's your opinion on this? Do you, do you think Capcom should go back to the survival horror origins of Resident Evil instead of going with this new action orientated thing that they're doing at the moment? Absolutely, because if you if you look at the the trends for gaming, everybody's the the games that kind of go touch back to their retro roots seem to do better. I mean, Sonic Generations when they touched back with the original Sonic uh, gameplay, it, it was fantastic. I love that game. So it seems like more games that go back to their original roots, uh, the better they do in sales. So I think if they touch back to the Resident Evil one, two, three, you know, get back to that type of uh, gameplay, I think we'll be good to go. Brilliant. What about you, Sean? Then then they say that they were going back to their roots like in Resident Evil Six. 
and that turned out to be a pile of bullshit. Yeah, I'm positive well, they said something similar on those lines. Well, the new um, Resident Evil game that came out, the one from the 3DS, uh, what was it called? Resident Evil... Revelations. Revelations, that was it. Um, when that came out, they decided to cross-platform it because of how successful it was on the 3DS. So, you know, it's, it's a good thing. I think uh, what's happening now, maybe that's making them look at it and think, actually, that that's going to be a positive. Um, you got any more news for us, Travis? Uh, let's see, I do have one more, well, a quick one. we got something that's related to both Mega Man and Crash Bandicoot. Ooh. No, new, no new games in the pipeline. That's it for that story. Um, no new games in the pipeline. <laughs> no new games in the pipeline for either one, I'm sorry. Uh-huh. <laughs> Don't cry, Dace, it's fine. We'll, we'll get to this together. Hey, hey I, I would do anything for a new Crash Bandicoot, Dace. I mean, I'm with I, you on that because that is... I mean, I'll never forget the first time I played that game when the when the game when it came out in 1996. That was fucking awesome. I wish there was a new game. I I just kind of want to go out and you know how they do those like memorials around where people like got hit by cars and shit like that. I want to do that in front of Naughty Dog and just put like wreaths and just pictures of Crash. And say we miss you. <clears throat> have a candlelight visual in front of their place. Just give them the idea that we won our our past back. You might want to do that for um, over at Activision because they own the property. So it's Activision. Activision. Well, I might just—I'm I'm, going to piss on their gates since they're taking so long. Makes them a character in the new Skylanders game, Activision. Oh. <laughs> well, they did the Spiral. Can't understand why can't they can't do a Crash Bandicoot type game? Yeah. Or at least have them as a property, like leave or not. Or have them like a special online only purchase, and you buy the. The, the toy and they give you a special code. I mean, that'd be a great idea. Yeah, I wouldn't mind it. I wouldn't mind having to crash in the, the Skylander games. That, that would, you know, make people happy and it would make Dace go out and buy little figures. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> I would buy the entire Spyro game if Crash showed up. I kid you not. So there you go, Activision. You want to make some money? Just put, start putting Crash in, like, random games. <laughs> Okay, but here's a here's a real news story. Sega's HD remake of Castle of Illusion has a release date. The first 8-bit adventure of Scrooge McDuck isn't the only vintage Disney platformer to receive an HD remastering this summer, as Sega is set to release an HD remake of the Genesis classic Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse onto Steam, Xbox Live Arcade, and PSN on September 3rd. This release date isn't the only news uh, concerning the game, they have, um, which I have a good report on. As Sega has also announced its price, which is 15 US dollars or 1200 Microsoft points. The company also stated PS3 users will be given some very special items that they pre-order, pre- uh, pre-ordered on the PSN between August 20th and September 2nd. These bonuses are an exclusive dynamic theme and three avatars, along with a copy of the original Castle of Illusion. How cool is that? I'm happy about that. I think that's awesome. So now, I, I'm I'm not sure about um, when it's going to come out in Europe, but yeah, for us American um, PS uh, PlayStation Three owners, yeah, we have that chance to get that game. So that's awesome. That that is awesome. I I can't wait for it. Actually, and this is hopes this could be a Disney trend. We might be seeing an Aladdin remastered. Or we could see, like, you know, something else remastered in terms of the Disney games. What's your favorite? <gasps> Quack Shots. That's the oh, one. yes. <laughs> that would be awesome. I would freaking sink all my money into that. Disney, if you want my money, remaster Quack Shots. Oh, saying on that subject, let's go to Sean. Sean, what's Hello. the news this week? Uh, Activision released their multiplayer for more multiplayer footage of Call of Duty Ghosts, which looks pretty damn good I have to admit like I'm not a big Call of Duty fan myself but I'm quite interested in it it looks really really good and and you can actually play as a woman <gasps> there, take that Anita Sarkeesian take that up your anus there you go Call of Duty has women in it now what are you going to say <laughs> to that huh huh <laughs> their, their periods are going to attract bears while they're fighting <laughs> You think the dogs would be sitting there sniffing it? Right. <laughs> so, anything else for us, Sean? Uh, yeah. Nintendo, you're a bunch of douchebags. 
I'll I, soon. I agree <laughs> on that one. Yeah, you know, I, for those of you who don't know, I've actually aired this in the Dace Man show as well. Nintendo have decided to put my video for the E3 Nintendo Direct as copyright infringement and have given me a copyright strike on my account, limiting my videos to 15 minutes and also stopping me from um, basically using any of the account features such as thumbnails and other little bits and pieces. So I am now, my whole reputation on YouTube has gone down the shitter because of Nintendo. And I would like to say a great big thank you to you guys at Nintendo, you fucking douchebags. What a way to actually retract your audience. And also for the fact that you didn't fix Sean's 3DS, where you should have done because it was named Wear and Tear, which is covered under the Consumer Rights Agreement, which is covered under your warranty, you douchebags. Anything else you'd like to add on that, Sean? Um, that's a big tip. I think that's it for me, bud. Okay, Dace, the floor is yours. Got two pieces of news. First of all, today, a part of their uh, SummerSlam access, and we're, cross, we're, we're merging wrestling now, uh, the WWE 2K14 roster was revealed. And it has such names as Batista, Andre the Giant, Brock Lesnar, both 2002 and today, Chris Jericho, Retro and Today, Diesel, Goldberg, Hollywood Hulk Hogan, JBL, and the list goes on and on. So there's a neat feature that will be a part of the game, which is called 30 Years of WrestleMania, where you'll get to relive some of the famous WrestleMania moments, such as Ricky Steamboat versus uh, Macho Man Randy Savage, King uh, Under the Giant versus Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold versus The Rock, etc. So you, uh, the, the roster looks really great uh, with the additions of the Ultimate Warrior, Yokozuna, uh, Ted DiBiase. It, it, it's really getting me pumped for like such a huge Legends roster for this uh, mode. Does it also have Zack Ryder versus Catering? I'm pretty sure there's that, and if you beat Catering, you actually unlock it to the point where he will beat the streak and pin The Undertaker <laughs> at WrestleMania 30. <laughs> <laughs> if enough people finish that challenge mode in WWE uh, 2K14, Vince McMahon will rewrite the storyline for Zack Ryder going over at WrestleMania. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Ryder or riot chance, people. Ryder or riot. For sure. Uh, for us? The other news that I got is at a during an event in Japan this weekend, fans spotted a brief tease uh, for a potential Pokemon game on the Wii U. So... I hope so, because I have nothing for my Wii U right now, and I would love Pokemon if it came out there. If it's like Pokemon Stadium, that'd be badass. Well, apparently they, they're going to have um, a Pokemon game which is going to be NFC-enabled. It's going to be pretty much like Skylanders, but you'll be using the tablet. Where oh, yeah. I've seen that. The tablet. They've been planning this um, for a while now, and apparently they're going to sell them in these little boxes, pretty similar to Japanese stores, where they'll sell you figurines. It's... It, Okay, I think we we need a sort of a seven. What's in the bag? <laughs> <laughs> it's that you you go in this box and you it, there's no severed heads, of course, but there's there's oh. in there. There's Pokemon figures, but you you have you, you're paying like two pounds, like two dollars fifty for these things, um, which is a good thing. I hope they do it. I'm a huge Pokemon fan. You know, and especially when, you know, if I go and buy one and I'm near day, so I'll just go, what's in the bag? <laughs> well, it looks like it's called Pokemon Rumble U, I think the game you're referring to, because I see the little figures on uh, Google right now, and they look hideous. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are the figures that you're that I'm referring to. Pokemon Rumble U. But every time I see a box now, I'm going to go, what's in the bags? <laughs> and they're all going to look really weird at me. They'll be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, <laughs> that motherfucker. They're not going to be able to handle your awesomeness. That's that's what's going to happen. They're going to break I down. I, I say that to all the women. They never handle my... That's why Nikki's not here. She can't handle my awesomeness. Mm, sounds about right. <laughs> she was just scared that I was going to be on the show because we argue about everything. E exactly. I I think she's intimidated by the, the sexual premise of Dace. She knows that's how right. sexually charged you are, Dace. That's, that's what it is. Nikki, oh, get some. It's all the roids. Yeah, I mean, the lack thereof. You did not hear that, people. <laughs> well, let's finish this news segment by going on to my little bit of news. Grand Theft Auto Online has been announced. And there is an announcement trailer. If you go to GameStop, uh, GameSpot, not GameStop, GameSpot.com, 
Um, there is a GTA Online trailer, and it's available on PS3 and Xbox 360. It hasn't actually stated when this will be happening, but it's a multiplayer open world game, and it's full of excitement and adventure. You get to earn money, get yourself up in a crime spree, and myself and someone like Dace can actually team up together and rob some motherfuckers. So if you love GTA and you want to see more and you want to see a GTA sort of MMO type game, this is your chance. So make sure that you get a copy of that. And uh, what else is in the news? Microsoft secures a Fable Legends domain. So they've got new Fable-related content onto a new domain called Fable Legends. That's probably the, really the new Fable game for the Xbox One. Um, and also, Final Fantasy XIV and Realm Reborn open beta server continues to grow with two new worlds that's been created. So there you go. That's the news for this week, guys, and we were going to be moving on to our next topic, of course, and that is the theme of tonight's show. There you go. <laughs> I never get tired of that. I, I love that song. So tonight's theme is some people just want to watch the world burn. There you go, I've got tongue tied there. And tonight, <laughs> tonight's theme is villains. And we're talking about the fact that why villains are so popular in gaming. So well, you know, if you if you actually got your favourite villain, or you got a villain that you think is completely and utterly shit, you can give us a call on seven six zero five one two seven two four seven. That's seven six zero five one two seven two four seven. And if you call us, you get a very nice chat with Mister Dace himself, as he'll be. Doing, hey, he'll be doing his villain's voice. <laughs> you know, hey, a paedophile Paul. Um, <laughs> so let's oh, let's go on to that on the subject of villains because villains are the main antagonists in games. They're the Bowsers who kidnap Princess Peach. They're your Warios who cause havoc in Mario's lives. They're your Travis Gosses. Who <laughs> <laughs> They're also the, the, the main bad guys in your games. They could kidnap your girlfriend, beat the living shit out of her, and you still love them. So guys, why are <laughs> villains so popular? So we'll start with you, Travis. Why why would you say that villains are so popular in gaming? Well, for one thing, it they motivate you to complete the game because you know you want to do what you always want to do in real life, which is whoop the bad guy's ass. <laughs> uh, no, because <clears throat> Nintendo, <clears throat> you, know, you know, I'm just saying. Yeah, that's that's true. That'd be so funny if we did a, 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 a Miyamoto game. Just like have him in there as the villain, and you're just beating the living shit out of him. I love you, Miyamoto. It's not your fault. I just want to beat the crap out of your lawyers. So what about you, Dace? Why are these villains so popular? What what makes them so special? Because they can do whatever the hell they want. Being the bad guy is the best part because you have you you don't fear the consequences and you can just do whatever the hell you want. And I think that's awesome. I would love to curb stomp someone. <laughs> what about you, Sean? What makes villains so popular in gaming? You know, it's like even in films and in television, you have a villain. Why? Why are they so appealing? Oh, I, I think that they're appealing because um, it drives the story forward. Without without a villain, it's just basically Minecraft on steroids, isn't it, Mario? You know, <laughs> that's, that's one way of looking at it, isn't it? But even Minecraft has bad guys. Like, you know, they have villains. They look look at a creeper. You know. You just want to give her a hug and it blows you up in the face. <laughs> it drives the story forward. That's what villains are supposed to do. And if they don't drive the story forward, they're not doing their job and they should get the fuck out. 
Yeah, and that's, that's the main point. You know, before with games, there, there were certain levels of games like Pong, for instance, I never had an antagonist, never had a villain. But once games started developing a bit of a story, we had villains. Like, the, the earliest villain I can think of is Donkey Kong. There might be an uh, earlier one than that. Can anyone think of an early villain from, like, the Atari ages? The uh, Pong paddle. <laughs> that son of a bitch wouldn't let me past. An asteroid. <laughs> Kept blowing up my little triangle, little fucks. It's never the big fuck. It's always the little fucks that come afterwards. Oh, and the spaceship. The yeah. Spaceship just go past go, woo, woo, woo. So, therefore, asteroids are the greatest villain of all time. <laughs> So, guys, after saying this, let's go into the 100 best villains in gaming. Ooh. A great hero is nothing without a great villain. And honestly, who cares about the kid picking up a sword or going on for his adventure? There isn't some evildoer waiting at the end of the trail. It's the villain that makes the hero. The role of the bad guy is the most important of them all. Now, we're going to go through the 100 greatest villains in gaming. And we'll start off with this person... Master Hand from Smash Brothers. <laughs> In his first appearance on the title screen of Super Smash Brothers, Master Hand just seems like a whimsical, disembodied hand that likes to bring trophies to life. In reality, he's a maniacal mas- masochist that likes to watch Nintendo's cute mascots battle to the death. He watches as brothers fight brothers, rivals pummel each other into oblivion, and laughing as other favorite video game characters duke it out in a no holes barred battle royal. Plus, his twitchy alter ego, Crazy Hand, is the embodiment of evil. Hand gestures, just the way that Crazy Hand, the thwarted fingers move in the screen, creep the loving fuck out of us. Now, what, what do you think of Master Hand, guys, from Smash Brothers? Do you think he's, he's a villain? Does he remind you of the creepy hand from Evil Dead? I want a high five. Uh, you want Rob a- Master Hand. Okay, we can give, we can give Master Hand a high five. Yes! So far. <laughs> For the big doll. For the big doll. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'll start with you then, Sean. What do you think about Master Hand? Do you think he's the one of the hundred greatest villains in gaming? I, I could think of plenty others, to be fair. <laughs> Master Hand, who, who come up with that? Really? <laughs> he's, he's not a villain. He just needs to touch himself. <laughs> What about you, Travis? I always thought that um, I always thought the Master Hand was you know, was like the kid playing with the figurine. That's the way we always looked at it. There was just some person who had collected all these uh, figurines of all the Nintendo characters, and he was just playing with them. I didn't even think it was a villain. Well, he's going to be like the last boss that we'll actually see in a story orientated mode in the Smash Brothers games because of the fact that. Nintendo, in their whole claim against the internet, have decided that, nope, we're not going to have any more story modes because we're Nintendo and we can do whatever the fuck we want. Like, not repair Sean's DS. Exactly. The tricks. I don't suppose you have a crying baby sound effect to go along with that, huh? I I don't. Shit. I've got this, though. It's got us, uh, we're, we're pretty butthurt about it. <laughs> I didn't catch that because I heard. His... Well, it's pretty much that me and Sean are. It's got us. Uh, we're we're pretty butt hurt about it. Oh, uh, okay. There we go. I didn't hear it the first time. Yeah. <laughs> so there we go. And the next one on our list is surprise, motherfucker. Nemesis, Resident Evil Three. At ninety nine. <laughs> He's at 99 here, on the list. That guy used to scare the shit out of me. Fuck that. He's number one. You think Wesker's bad news? He's nothing compared to Nemesis, the whole clean bow engineer to hunt down surviving stars members. Not only can Nemesis probably kill you with his haunting visage alone, he's also a walking tank, practically incapable of dying and 100% capable of brutal murder. Just ask poor Brad Vickers, who received a piercing tentacle through the face. There's nothing worse than thinking you finally escaped Nemesis relentless pursuit only to hear a gluttering stars just up ahead. Stars. So Dace, you're saying you you believe he deserves to be higher on the list? 
Absolutely. That guy used to terrify me. I know I was only in one game, but he still terrified the shit out of me. Literally. Like, I think, shit. Everywhere. I think that's, the, that's the biggest thing. If he was only a supporting villain, if he was like a main villain in the games, he'll probably receive a hell of a lot more praise than that. Um, it's a shame, and he, he was so intimidating that they brought him back for the Resident Evil live-action movie starring Mira Yosovich. Mm-hmm. which we'll never talk of again. So, yeah, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> and at number 98, we have Dr. Neo Cortex from Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> <laughs> that stubby frame, the sulfur-coloured complexion, the clownish hairstyle, and the N permanently stamped on his forehead for Nintendo. No wonder N Cortex is always so mad. This evil scientist compensates for his ghastly appearance by being as brilliant and maniacal as possible constructing robots of mass destruction faster than most people put together furniture. In a delightful twist, Cortex is actually the creator of his hated enemy, Crash. After zapping the bandicoot with his evolver ray, even as you're following his dastardly plans, it's hard not to feel bad for that little lunatic. So, we'll go with you, Travis. What do you think of him? Um, well, he's quite cartoony in his own right. I mean, of course, he has all these things he's trying to do to trap crash and everything and it's really cool um i like him quite a bit because he's um with the exceptions of the first game he was actually voiced by clancy brown throughout the most of the game's existence but the the franchise's history that is and you know well being a fan and advocate for bringing back crash dace what do you think of this one do you think it deserves to be at 98 90 fucking eight are you serious <laughs> he is the greatest villain in the top ten of all time, okay? He does not belong at 98. That guy, he's another one who shaped my childhood. They are killing me in the inside. <laughs> like, I am dying. Who, whoever made this list obviously played games in, like, 2000 and above, so you're a ten-year-old. Congratulations, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Well, let's go to number 97. The Reapers, the Mass Effect trilogy. Defeating the Reapers should have been impossible. If the Reapers invaded Earth in the real life, like they did in Mass Effect 3, would simply be dead. Because these colossal machines would have wiped out life in the universe as we know it. Staring down a single one is intimidating enough, like going toe-to-toe with a laser-blasting skyscraper-sized clutterfish. And for the countless Reapers hibernating in the dark, in the space, unimaginable horror with part of H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu in their incredible power it's enough to corrupt a noblest champion like Serene and effortlessly snuff out the most advanced alien civilization that ever was so we'll go to you Sean what do you think of the Reapers being at numbers 97 who <laughs> you didn't ever play Mass Effect I've I've played Mass Effect but I, I, I don't pay any attention to the characters the game just bored me <laughs> what about you Dave yeah, that, they belong in 97. I don't know who they are. <laughs> Fair enough. What about you, Travis? Do you have anything to say? Uh, no, I don't because I never played any of the Mass Effect games. Okay. All right. Right, let's move on to number 96. Chaos Ballard, Final Fantasy thirteen two. Uh, tongue tied again. <laughs> Don't let severed headdress fool you. Chaos is no nonsense kind of guy whose sole interest is bringing about the apocalypse. And as an immortal guardian of Ceres, he's been around the block a time or two wielding the humongous sword. You, you hear the whole dick jokes on that one. The unparalleled skill with his intentions, oddly enough, is tragically pure as he merely wants to end the suffering of the woman that he sworn to protect. Um, see Anita, he, he's, he's trying to end his girlfriend's life. I bet you're going to have a fucking field day with that one. Unfortunately, doing so means Lightning, Sarah, and Noel, and the goddess Etro must die. And everyone and everything around them is going to die too. So, guys, what do you think? Number 96. You should be at 96, because i got a bigger sword. <laughs> In your pants. Oh, uh, yeah. And next on the list, number 95, Getis Harmonia from Pokemon Black and White. He's the protagonist in Pokemon, is usually tasked with dominating the Pokemon leagues while simultaneously thwarting the plans of the team of elite thieves. Black and White shook up the formula with Team Plasma and its leader, Gytus, 
by making it an ideological battle. Gaitis railed a cult around the idea that was wrong to imprison Pokemon and make them battle. Uh, they sound like Peter. <laughs> Before his scheme was found out, it had us asking though, the question about the sport of Pokemon, of course, and Gaitis ultimately reveals himself to be the manipulative arsehole that's out to steal the world's Pokemon. Even after you defeat his brainwashing, he still finds other ways to endanger society. There's been... There's likely been no larger threat to the world of Pokemon than Gaitis. So here's hoping that he stays beaten at all times. So what do you think? Well, he's not really a villain, really, is he? he? He just wants to stop Pokemon from fighting each other. He's going the wrong way about it, like... But, you know... Is he just misunderstood, Sean? Yep. But, like, most of these villains are probably guessing on this list. You know, most of them are misunderstood. Here's another one for you. The Helia Hawthorne. The Ace Attorney series has a deep rose gallery of colourful characters. Some are selfish morons and others sadistic con men. But the Leia is Phoenix Wright's most insidious beneath her smiling persona and girlish face lies a sociopath that will do anything to get what she wants. But she won't do that. She killed her sister and boyfriend in an attempt to steal the inheritance and was willing to kill as many people as possible so she kept lying to everyone. You see, beyond her murderous intent, she was a master of subterfuge, creating seemingly enough false leads and red herrings to save herself. It took almost all of Wright's friends and a lot of luck to send her to death row. Though she even haunted the lawyers from beyond the grave. Believe us, once you see underneath her sprightly facade, there's no looking back. What do you think of her number 94, guys? I never played the, the series or the games. What about you, Dice? Nope. <laughs> so let's move on. <laughs> okay. Luca Blight from Sukoden 2. He is known as the Mad Prince Luca and didn't have too great of a childhood, for one. He watched his mum get raped by a group of ruffians, sounds like Night of Dace's house, while his cowardly father ran away in fear. Again, sounds like a Night of Dace's house. <laughs> <laughs> When he grew older, he became the leader of the Highland Kingdom, eventually waging war at the city-state of Jalston. During his campaign, he commits atrocious war crimes, burning villages, and killing innocents by the droves. One of his most devious acts involved making one villager beg for her life by crawling on her hands and knees and acting like a pig. Again, it sounds like a night at Dace's house. I would swear that happened at one of his parties. Oh, it oh, happens <laughs> every Saturday, just throwing it out there. Oh, shit, I'm late for it. <laughs> After she asked if she could go free, he says... Die pig and brutally kills her with the slash of his sword. Well, Dave doesn't brutally kill him with the slash of his sword, he just, you know, pees on their face. It's a metaphor for my penis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 92 is Sarin Arterius for Mass Effect. He's a grand scheme of things, Mass Effect Sarin turned out to be a not so big of a deal. Really, not much more than a minor arsehole. Truth be told, he is, after all, the equivalent of a put upon redneck. In Mass Effect terms, a known space racist. He's Turian supremacist, ways to make him susceptible to sovereign indoctrination, and that's indoctrination that spurred his intergalactic killing spree. So yes, Saurian was a pawn, but considering the mountain of bodies he created, he was a pawn to challenge kings. So we'll go move on from that, because none of you like Mass Effect anyway, so fuck that. Okay, here's one that you guys might know, being Metal Gear Solid fans, at number 91, The Boss. Oh yes. It always sounded like Big Boss was, well, the Big Boss of Metal Gear franchise, but when we were placed in the shoes of Metal Gear Solid 3, we met his teacher, The Boss. Their relationship was quickly become a reverse of Obi-Wan and Darth Vader, where the teacher betrayed the student. And America! For the cell of terrorists, The Boss takes it easy on you at first, but eventually she stops playing nice with Naked Snake, even though they're former lovers. As the game continues, you find out more and more that Boss might be the best soldier that ever lived. One that even with her enemies respected when you learn her secrets by the game's end, you come to realise she's likely the most horrible opponent you'll ever face. No wonder Snake ended up saluting her grave. She deserves no less. What do you guys think? Uh, I've only played Metal Gear Solid 4, so I, I don't know much about the series, but what I remember about um, Big Boss in um, Metal Gear Solid 4, he was, he was kind of a douche, you know. So I can but, see why he's on the list, right? Well, that's not for Big Boss. It's actually the boss. That's the Big Boss's boss. 
Yes. What about, um, what about you, uh, Dice? I love the Metal Gear Solid franchise. I'm actually excited for the new one coming out soon. The- uh, that's got like an open world map, but the boss, I didn't get to play Metal Gear Solid 3, unfortunately. I played all the other ones, but not that one. Travis? Oh, man. I actually, when I was playing that game, I, I'm i going to be honest, I didn't even see that coming. When, um, spoiler alert, if you haven't played it, when she actually betrays them. I totally did not see that coming, but wow, her to be the ultimate soldier at the time? Man, oh, man. Here's one that you guys might find hilarious. Number 90 is Mario in Donkey Kong Jr. Interesting, but true. One of their greatest heroes in gaming history was not so great in his second appearance after besting Donkey Kong in the arcade classic of the same name. Mario locked the dumb animal in a cage and continuously whipped him. And when DK's cute ape son tried to rescue his papa, Mario sprung a multitude of death traps on the child, intent on murdering him a dozen times over. Once DK was freed, he gave Mario a swift kick for his troubles, and he seemed to have taught the plumber a lesson about animal cruelty that he soon didn't forget. So do you guys think that he deserves to be number 90 on the villains list? Well, he hasn't learned his lesson about animal cruelty. He keeps kicking turtles, so... (laughs) Yeah, he went into a plentiful world where he can just basically destroy as many animals as possible. What about you, Dave? Who was it again? I'm sorry. Mario. In oh, he's an absolute Italian. dick. <laughs> Fucking Italian. <laughs> well, he keeps keeping Luigi down. What about yeah. Travis? Um, I wouldn't put him that high on the list. I mean, he, I probably would have switched him out with Dr. Cortex. I'm just saying. Because it's not, he wasn't really that well known of a villain back in the day. Just for one game, and that's about it. Very true, but it was actually kind of weird that they actually did that with him. It was nice having a little role reversal with Donkey Kong Jr., where right. Donkey Kong was actually the damsel in distress. Take that and eat yourself, cures you, you bitch. And you see, you know, uh, yeah, you had this big, strong male ape who looked like a fucking silverback being trapped in a cage and whipped continuously by a short, fat plumber. Huh? Yeah, there's no peach in this one, is it? No, you didn't talk about that one, did you, you bitch? Right, anyway. Pretty sure he's a part of the mafia. That's why he's such a bad guy. Exactly. Yeah. He is. He's part of the, the gaming mafia. So let's go to number 89 now. It grew from Zork. Now let's be clear about this. It's pitch black and you're likely to be eaten by a Gru. Now, not to alarm you or anything, but the Gru, which kept adventures honest and stoked with torches and seminal 1980 text-based adventure game Zork, is known to having a slavering fangs, razor-sharp claws, and yes, would even make horrible gurgling noises. The Gru is a villain's villain whose looming presence alone served to dissuade the hero from accomplishing his goal and that he was made all more sinister by the limitations of early gaming hardware. And as the game's text-based nature left the player's imagination to run wild, what is the Gru? What is slavering? Oh, my God. Where's the torch? Well, there you go on that one. We're not going to go into that one too much because I don't think you guys play test-based. I, I've, I've played Zork. Could never get past the Gru. He kept eating me. There we go. Oh my god, Sean Walker actually played it. I'm a nerd, dude. Of course I'm going to play the game. Are you an angry video game nerd? Um, I wouldn't say I'm that angry. Um, <laughs> it's in my nature to be angry because I'm Welsh, but you know. Here's another one from a series that was kind of shit. Number 88, Rider White, Dead Island. Admittedly a misinformed, hardened military type who passed a psychometric test by agreeing in principle to kill his own wife, if required to, he certainly made life even harder for Dead Island's heroes. Then it was already was, ultimately turning into a hulkling great infected abomination and trying to kill the lot of them. But the Ryder White's campaign DLC reveals that many of his underhanded actions were actually to the end of saving lives of the infected, his infected wife Emily from the life of lurking about and munching on human livers. So maybe he wasn't all that bad, but he was still quite bad. Have you guys gone against him? Do you play Dead Island? Nope. Nope. I've played it, but haven't gotten that far yet. So I know the game's kind of hard to actually play because it's just boring. Yeah, I, I got I tapped out, and went to something else. Okay, uh, eighty-seven Hazama Blaze Blue Calamity Trigger. Hazama has two sides to him. It, it, exquisitely smooth criminal and maniacal killer and by all appearances he seems cool calm and collected he's got a dapper suit sly grin and he's modestly threatening twin butterfly knives 
Sounds like Dave's. But when he shows his true colours and unleashes his Yuki Terran persona, you're as good as dead. If his lives aren't enough to shred you to pieces, his snake-headed Gemini's Angurium chain will slice you in twain. And then again, Hazama would probably get a kick out of prolonged fight, seeing that he delights the pain and misery of others. And he's kind of the guy who smiles from ear to ear when he's torturing you. Guys, play Blaze Blue. Nope. Nope. Okay, let's go on. The next one on the list is Lionel Starkweather from Manhunt. He's number 86. Starkweather is a former movie producer who now directs snuff videos, which he pits one man against a gang of psychopaths to see who wins, capitalising on their sheer brutality of life and death encounters. It's like Smash TV, only way, of, way darker. He's the cruelest of the cruel villains, repeatedly tricking you into doing things for his pleasure and financial gain before breaking his promise and making you watch him kill your family. But when you finally meet him in person, it turns out he's just a fat bloke with squishy bits that come apart easily when introduced to a chainsaw. Yuck. (laughs) So there you go. Have you guys played Manhunt? I didn't. I thought it was stupid as shit. He deserves to be number 86 then. Number 85, Darth Malak from Star Wars Old Republic. Now, I'll leave it to you guys. What can you tell us about Darth Malak? Travis, have you played Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic? I'm afraid not. I'll have to pass on this one. What about you, Chris? I have, and he is a dick. <laughs> tell us why. He's just tough. I think I actually played this game up to him, and then couldn't beat him, so I left him. <laughs> He's that difficult, is he? He was for me, because I'm a nov- I, I actually I'm probably a beginner game player when it comes to this type of shit, and he just whooped my, my ass. So apparently Darth Malak eventually decided he was too good or bad to remain under the shadow of his master, double-crossed him with an underhanded assault during a fierce battle against the Jedi. The Sith, worse than his own Sith master, is quite the Sith indeed. And Malak confirmed his reputation following the betrayal with a spree of planet destruction, torture, and seduction of Jedi to the dark side. What a guy. Awesome. What about you, Sean? Have you played against him? Uh, I've never played against him. Okay, next one, 84. King Pig, Angry Birds. <laughs> so, Sean, I'll leave the floor to you on this one because you played Angry Birds, didn't you? You downloaded it recently while you were on the toilet. I, I, I've, I've only downloaded the Star Wars one because I refused to follow the crowd. The only reason I've downloaded Angry Birds Star Wars is so i got something to do whilst I'm taking a shit. <laughs> what about you, Dace? What do you think? Do you think King Pig deserves to be in number 84 here? No, I think he's actually a good guy. Dude's got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Travis? Again, it's not that major of a character. I mean, it would put him a little bit lower on the list, but okay, sure. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know, basically, King Pig is a jerk. He's the big green idiot that laughs and smiles at your following birds as they bounce ineffectively around you. The stupid grin he cracks when he falls and infuriating. If you want to hate him for another reason, you can consider him responsible for the Angry Birds phenomenon. He's the one who can commanded his pigs to steal the bird's eggs so that he's technically responsible for the whole series. So there you go, guys, on that one. Okay. So 8-3, Death Adder, Golden Axe. Do you guys remember this guy? Oh, yes, I do. I never owned a Seager. Tell us about him. Oh, uh, uh, he's a very tough dude. (laughs) I haven't played this game in a long time, but yeah, he was such a pain in the ass. (laughs) Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> basically uh, Death Vader he was the one of those main characters in the game that would destroy the shit out of you if you were playing on the arcade you'd have to pump quarters just to basically beat this guy yep. going life after life after life while he maniacally laughs at you as he's destroying you and your wallet yeah, exactly <laughs> He's a genocidal maniac from the 80 Sega's beat him up, so if you want to check that out, I suggest you go into a bit of retro gaming and check out Golden Axe. There's another one, Jacked Final Fantasy X. He's number 82 on the list. What do you guys think? Has anyone played Final Fantasy X? I have it. I have never completed it, so no. Pass. Okay, I'll talk about him a little bit. His poor parenting is just one of Jack's many shortcomings. In case you didn't know already, Jack is one on the list because he's Final Fantasy X's final villain, or sort of. He's a real culprit who's trying to destroy the world and is best known as Sin. 
who he had merged with Jack in the earlier encounter, minus the other side, Spyro's former principal star still wasn't exactly an upstanding citizen or an upstanding parental figure. Jack was a borderline alcoholic with intimacy issues, while well, kind of sounds like Dace. Dace, did, a lot of these characters are based on you. I think you need to sue for copyright. I should. <laughs> Stop telling my story. Let me tell my story. <laughs> Uh, apparently he was made up of memories of citizens of Zanakand, but tedious emotions were, and you can't help but feel sorry for the kid, even though he did whine a lot. So there you go. Um, 81, the monster in Papo and Yo. Anyone play this game? Papo and who? Monster is your friend in Papo and Yo, but he has a bit of a frog problem, by which we mean that he eats lots of frogs. He tries to beat the hell out of you, and it's not unlike alcoholism, except actually it's just alcoholism. He's a monster with, who's an alcoholic. And the game's creator apparently made him because he had a troubled childhood with an abusive father, and the game's story is symbolic of that. And the knowledge of the real-world events sprinkled throughout the game makes him even more depressing, and it makes this monster even more horrible. Here's one for your Animal Crossing lovers. So, you know, for Nikki, even though she's not on the show. Tom Nook from Animal Crossing. Do you know who this guy is? I should do, because you were on about him all last week. Yeah. He is... Right, how could he be evil, most say? But he's a stripy, furry, and cute, but he's one of an absolute bastard who's obsessed with making money. He does it through the worst methods. He'll give you something lovely, like a house, and then ask you to pay for it. Of course, you know that paying for this off will immediately unlock the next house extension. But all that does is get you to even more and more debt. Tom Nook loves it when you owe him money. So Tom <coughs> Nook, you can go to fucking hell. He is annoying though. He he literally, he gives me a house in the fucking game. Like, here's your house. By the way, you owe me 90 grand. Sounds like a loan shark. He, he is a fucking loan shark. Uh, uh, any of you guys are a fan of Old World Abe Odyssey, Abe's Odyssey? I am... Well, do you know Moloch? Yes. He's number 79 on it. So tell us, Travis, about Moloch. He's a guy who runs basically uh, this huge corporation where they've taken all these, these creatures and turned them into food products for them mostly. And they're running out of stock, so they were coming out with something that was called New and Tasty, which basically was... Um, the various creature, the, the creature that uh, Abe is. I forgot what he is. Um, you have to help me with that one. But they were going to turn Abe and his uh, his people into this new food item called New and Tasty. Yeah, he basically he was the head of the Rupture Farms in 1029, and all he cares about is meeting the bottom line. And if that means feeding defenseless enslaved Mudokans into a meat grinder. Arming sticks with machine guns and instructing them to shoot anything that moves, then so be it. There's Mullet for you. 78, if you guys have played the Tekken games. Yes, I have. Guess who yep. this guy is? I'm shocked that he's so high up. I figured he'd be closer to the top 10 because he was the key guy through the whole entire series. Hiachi Mishima. Now, oh, oh yeah. So, who wants to talk about Hiachi? Anyone? No? Okay. That's um, Jin's grandfather, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. He, he was a badass. And he, and he wore sandals, man. You've got to be a badass <laughs> to wear sandals. Plus his oh hairstyle, man. He looks like an eagle. And he's gotten greyer and greyer, isn't he, since the game's inception? So, yep. Be and thankful. He is my fourth favourite character. There you go. That he should have been higher on the list. You'd be thankful that Hiachi isn't your dad, because it, if he was, you showed you any sign of weakness or compassion, he would throw you off a fucking cliff. Yeah, he sounds like my dad. <laughs> he has his reasons, of course. You're only his son if you survive the fatal plummet and the climb back up the mountain, as he's the owner of Mishima Zibatsu Empire and the host of the Tekken tournament. Hiachi is far more menacing than a spiky white hair would suggest. Thanks in part to the almighty devil gene that courses through his veins. Even if you manage to scratch him, he'll simply tag in his grizzly bear buddy, Kuma, and that'll even maul your face off. So there you go, Hiachi Mishima. Um, okay, what about Brutal Legend, Emperor Devo, De, 
I'm trying to pronounce this one. Dovicolous. Anyone played the game? Should I just say Jack Black should be in this list because anything with Jack Black in is just utter crap. It was a terrible game. How something could be so metal but intrinsically evil. Dovicolous isn't satisfied with simply ruling over demonic legions of tainted Kyle. No, he wants the existence of the Age of Metal to serve him. While some villains would like you to believe that they're heartless in case of the Vicus, it's actually true. The fact that you just spite you, he rips out your love interest beating heart and slaps it into his own chest cavity, which comes complete with the quick interlocking ribcage access that also where the Vicus stores his four-necked electric guitar, which is undeniably badass. So there we go on that one. 70C6, Queen Slug, for a butt. Earthworm Jim. Alright. This one. <laughs> so Travis, why don't you go for it? Hmm. Where do I begin? <laughs> uh, basically, if for anybody who's played Earthworm Jim, the first one, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm munching out some candy. <laughs> um, Basically, it's one of, uh, that was like the most bizarre, craziest villains I've ever p- came across in any video game because of the simple fact she was fucking ugly as hell. And oh, I could just go on and on about her, but we got like a limited amount of time on this show, so <laughs> I'll let you take this one, Michael. But yeah. Th- if you want to see, like, the ugliest damn villain in the whole world or in, in video game history, play Earthworm Jim. Apparently she wanted Jim's suit, right? and uh, she's basically had diabolical plans, including utterly destroying Earthworm Jim and reclaiming his power suit, which she will then use to take over the universe. But no one's exactly sure how she would fit her gigantic anus in his suit. Okay, now here's That's another what she one. Said. <laughs> <laughs> Who's ever played Fallout will know the master. At number 75, when humanity reverts to its base state, inevitable apocalypse, you can be sure there will be some bad mama jammers running about. Case in point, the master from Fallout. The scientist turned by a more blob god. The master built an army of so-called genetically perfect super mutants, ostensibly to prevent another life-ending war. And by built an army, we mean ditch humans in vat and forced a venerary virus in order to transform them into mindless, sterile freaks. And considering humanity was barely hanging on a thread basically going into near extinction, the last thing it needed was this guy. Okay, now here's another one. 74, Zachary Hale, Comstock, Bioshock Infinite. Who's played Bioshock Infinite and wants to take the, the lead on this one? Anybody? Nope. Which one's Bioshock Infinite? The new one. Uh, I have not played that yet. Okay. So don't give me any spoilers, man. Lord Comstock is a religious madman, one who thinks he can create a floating city and uses it on some kind of modern day Noah's Ark while he cleanses the world below with fire. He's a nutcase. But while that would be enough evidence alone to justify his inclusion on this list, there is a twist at the end of the game that makes his character utterly brilliant. And I'm not going to say anything else, okay, because if I, I don't want to know, it, I'm going to spoil it for Sean and he's going to kill me. Pretty much. Okay, so here's another one. Dragon Quest V. Has anyone played that? Nope. Ladger from Dragon Quest V. Uh, never heard of Ladger. So here's a quick rundown of how evil he is. He threatens to murder children. He kills the hero's father right in front of the hero's eyes. He sells the hero into child slavery. And he's trapped for eight years. Much later, he's just as the hero is about to get his hard-earned vengeance. Ladger turns the hero and the hero's wife into stone where they will remain for more than a decade, and Larger is no generic fantasy bad guy. He makes things very personal. So here's another one for you guys. I think you know who this is. Mother Brain, Metroid, at number 72. Anybody want to actually talk about Metroid? I haven't picked up this series. What about you, uh, Travis? <clears throat> um... I've, I've played original Metroid several times. Well, I shouldn't say several times, but many times. But I've never finished it. But all I know is it doesn't take much to finish her. Yeah, she's basically a brain in a jar. Mother Brain is able to control yeah. the hordes of space pirates. Deep inside the underground lair at the end of Metroid Prime Corruption, we find out that Mother Brain is actually an advanced Aurora supercomputer. Ever formidable, last boss, her appearance in Super Metroid is definitely 
the most memorable. In it, she dem- demonstrates her ability to morph into her bipedal monster form and shoots laser beams from her eyeballs. So there you go. Mother brain. Carmen San Diego. Oh, Where yeah. in the world is Carmen San Diego? Now, much is known about this elusive thief, considering you spent the majority of your time and indictment series talking to other people in order to catch the sly villain with an army of criminals at her disposal. If required, some serious sleuthing and giant almanac to bring her to justice to return all the world's precious artifacts. However, you also get to learn about geography. Even though we don't condone stealing, we have to hand it to Carmen. She was pretty damn good. So that's her at number 71. So let's go on to number 70. King Bohan. No, not me. Okay. We'll get into the whole Bohan jokes. From Heavenly Sword. So you guys played Heavenly Sword? Yes, I have. But I never finished it. Uh, King Bohan, truth be told, is the Sword King. He wouldn't be the villain as if he was not Andy Serkin's performance capture process, the actor whose skills were also seen as Golem in Lord of the Rings and Caesar in Rise of the Planet of the Apes brought about King Bohan's court and sheer hordenistic insanity that exudes. As for Bohan himself, well, he's a run-of-the-mill psychopath. He's there to gain the ultimate power in his true crime, running afoul and basically scintillating Nariko. So there we go on that one. Number 69, Wheatley, Portal 2. Who's played Portal 2? Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Uh, but I, I would love to play it, though, because uh, Stephen Merchant plays one of the characters. Wheatley is voiced by Stephen Merchant. Oh, there we go, then. And is part of the long and proud tradition of classic British bad guys. Lovable and bumbling at first, he eventually reveals himself to be a homicidal maniac. You sort of put him in charge of the Aperture Science Facility halfway through the game, and oops, although he continually tried to destroy us with lasers and Tourette's, he couldn't help but feel sympathy for Wheatley. He's just an AI-driven mad by loneliness and power. He even tried throwing ourselves off the ledge when he suggested it, because he was so polite. <laughs> now, I want, now I definitely want to play the game. Right, Resident Evil 4, number 68, Raymond Salazar. Woohoo! Somebody oh, I know! Yeah, you know who he is? He's the big, bald bloke. Yes. In Resident Evil 4. Yes, he is. And he runs the village, and he is an utter, utter tool. <laughs> he also I prefer the midget. With one of the beasts, doesn't he? Hmm? He merges. This is the midget, isn't it? No, um, Salazar is the big, big tall bloke who, um... No, no, he's the midget. Oh, he's, he's, he's the, he is the midget, is this? Yeah. He's a oh, well, that's even better. With a creepy, strong structure that finally little grit, too aware that his physical inadequacy compared to Leon, so he avoids direct confrontation until absolutely in- incapacitated, sniping Leon with a rasping, pithy venom every opportunity in the moment, but only when safety out, punching distance, Salazar is free to spend the entire castle section of Resident Evil floor flexing his arrogance from behind the safety of trips and traps and foot soldiers. Fortunately, he later makes the error of forgetting that it's unwise to leave rocket launchers lying around near a man who survived Raccoon City. So talk about him a little bit, Sean. The midget. The midget is fucking hilarious, man. (laughs) IR. His little suit, his little hat, his little arms, his pale face. He is... He is what I like to call a pale Oompa Loompa. (laughs) <laughs> so let's move on to number 67 Wario Super Mario Land 2 <laughs> oh this guy is so cool so Travis talk to us about Wario okay Wario basically um, was first introduced as you mentioned in Super Mario Land 2 uh, 6 golden coins for the Game Boy basically in this game he has uh, taken all the treasure from Mario, especially six golden coins, and you have to go and retrieve them. He's not, he may be a villain, but at the same time, his greed, he actually, he's more of a greedy character, as we can pretty well imagine, and he is so greedy, in fact, he actually started his own, his own empire called WarioWare Incorporated, and he has his own uh, games. He can find them in a lot of other sports games. And he has also some other titles in his own name as well. That are, and, that are adventure games. And he's also the arsehole that Mario invites to karting and parties. 
He's got to stop inviting the guy everywhere, seriously. He's got balls on his chin. <laughs> Wario! <laughs> well, here's number one. Number 66, Darth Vader. Um, Star Wars Force Unleashed. Anybody played Force Unleashed? Nope. I have. Yep. Dice, take it. He, uh, he's pretty much taking an apprentice under his own wing for the entire series, and since he was, like, working with him and all, uh, eventually, the Emperor finds out about this apprentice and has Darth Vader try to kill him, which pisses off the apprentice, and then the apprentice goes after him. So, it, it's good storyline. I, I don't agree with him being 66, because he's been a good villain in a lot of other games, so I don't know why he's so far back. Maybe it's because of the fact that he's actually sort of like a part of... It, it's basically because of this game alone and probably not because of the other games that he's been in. But I agree with you. He should have been higher up. Can I just say The Force Unleashed 1 and 2 is better than all of the prequels put together and then some. I agree with you on that one. Number 65, Zeus, God of War. Anyone played God of War? I have. They take it. He is a complete dick. Uh, he's not like Zeus from the movie Hercules from Disney. He is not that nice of a guy. He's not voiced by Rip Torn. He is just an absolute dick, and he he tries to kill Kratos, and Kratos gets what's his by the end of the uh, the trilogy. So he is a dick. So way to make the Greeks look bad by putting him as a villain. <laughs> Number 54, and for you Suda heads out there, and you know that I love Suda, so I'm going to take this one, is Fleming, Shadows of the Damned. The immortal and seemingly unkillable Fleming earned his spot as the top man in hell over the Manelia. He won't let any rebellious demon hunters dethrone him so easily and he plans to kidnap the demon hunter's girlfriend and hide her at the top of the castle and he's hardly new to video games. But what we really like about him is that Fleming threatens the protagonist's manhood all the while in-game, all about phallic imagery, Fleming surrounds himself with it as he proclaims his superior virility, which gives a comedic touch to such a gruesome bad guy. And you know what the fun thing about it as well? He actually depicts this girl lying in a bed with demons crawling out of her fucking chest. That's how nasty this guy is. It's brilliant. He's just a fucking nutcase in the heart. And yes, he does like to show how big his dick is. So, <laughs> number 63, Frank Horrigan, Fallout 2. Anyone played this game? Nope. Nope. When you meet Frank in Fallout 2, he's in the midst of senselessly murdering a band of defenseless apocalypse survivors. But what you can expect from a genetically engineered cyborg, psycho, total homicidal maniac. Of course, just murdering teams of innocents and hardly ground for inclusion in the cut down of the most infamous villainy. But no, what makes old Frank's crime so heinous is the fact that in post-apocalyptic world, there's basically no humans to spare. And the last thing civilization needs at this point is an indestructible, power armor clad sadistic mutant running amok but Frank Horrigan, that's just what you get. So, move on from Frank. It's number 62. Lance Vance, Grand Theft Auto, Vice City. Really? I can't okay. thanks. Travis, you know about him, so talk. Tell us who uh, see, he was, as far as I know, he was uh, jailed after um, doing some uh, business for a crime syndicate in uh, Liberty City. And when he was freed, this in, in 1986, he actually um, was sent down by that same mafia group and basically was trying to make sure the drug deal went as smoothly. Unfortunately, it did not, and he has to spend most of his time, the rest of the game, trying to build up an empire and all that good stuff. Him as a villain, yeah, and also at the same time, I kind of see him as a bit of a hero, so that's kind of interesting he's on the list. Well, this goes to number 61 now with Senator Stephen Armstrong from Metal Gear Rising. Senator Armstrong is America personified. America! America, fuck yeah. Now, we're not attempting to make some sort of political statement here or reach in some analogy. He's America in a tie with a flag printed on his suit. He's a big, buff politician filled with nanomachines that make him into an incredible hulk. His plan to end the war economy by causing a giant war. Yeah! And when the war economy doesn't make sense. No, no, it doesn't. Doesn't make an oddly compelling, insane, evil enemy. Sure does. God bless America. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Anybody else going to talk about Senator Stephen Armstrong? 
Nope. Nope. Here's the one for you. Skull Kid, the Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. He's at number 60. So he's played Majora's Mask. Who wants to chime in on this, Sean? I've, I've, I've only played it for like all of two minutes, so I've only recently downloaded it for the, for the Wii. Where is Nikki when you need her? Skull Kid was your average living scarecrow before he found a mysterious mask that transformed him into a destructive trickster. The creepy looking character has the personality of a murderous clown, and he attempts to crash the moon into the earth, obliterating the town of Tamina Field. And unlike most of the evil plans on his list, this one succeeds. Sure, Link eventually goes back in time to prevent it, but that still makes the oddball one of the most successful bad guys on the list because he actually did what he said he was going to do and that's crash the fucking moon that looks like a rapey that moon had a real rape face going on what the fuck was that about I don't know that's my pleasurable face mate you like that uh... that's the face I look to when I come mate you know <laughs> <laughs> number 59 Kane from the Legacy of Kane franchise does anybody remember Kane never played it I've got, a couple, I've got a couple of the games but no couldn't tell you Right, basically, Kane lives a more grey area. He's most of a villain on the list, but he definitely deserves his spot on one of the top 100 villains because he's an anti-hero that killed a group of assassins and reborn as a vampire out of vengeance. Though his new life started as a quest to regain his humanity, it was one desire for power that contained the sword of the Soul Reaver and eventually his rise as a monarch to Nosgoth and pushed him over to the villain side of the fence. From there, there was manipulating former comrades, making selfish decisions, and messing with time travel. You know this guy's bad stuff. So here's one for you. General Victor Serino, Bulletstorm. He's played, anyone played Bulletstorm? Never heard of it. On me again. That's number 58 on the list. Bulletstorm's General Serino is another villain that you love to hate. He's probably the most obnoxious, creatively potty mouth character in any game of his generation. He uses the Eco Squad to kill innocents. He sacrifices his troops at will, and he double-crosses everyone. However, he shines as a villain with his mouth open, inventing fresh, hilarious insults with every one-liner. Like, basically saying, sushi dick, murder fucker, and they, two of his more family-friendly catchphrases. Those guys got a real big potty mouth. And next on the list, Dog Eyes Lin, Sleeping Dogs. Though you might think the Chinese triad doesn't play the rules, it actually does. It just plays by its own. There are a specific thing that keep the different groups of vying for power in check to stop the crime factions that make up the Sun on Yi and developing into madness of the Dog Eyes Lin breaks out the rules and goes way too far, even going to avoid outright spoiling his most devious acts to trust us when he says that he proves there's no honour among thieves. So we go on to the next one. Hexter Le Mans, Grim Fandango. You said Fandango, right? Yes. <laughs> Greed is a powerful motivator in the afterlife. Hector here is an evil as film nor villains get, acting as a crime lord who pulls all the strings. He does all the dirty dealings in the land of the dead. Only he deprives innocent skeletons of something much more substantial than money, their chance at eternal peace. The man uses the Department of Death as a front for stealing number nine tickets, golden passes to board the train, and wish good souls to the tranquility of the night thunder world. Just like St. Peter greeting you at the pearly gates of heaven, gut checking you, swiping your wallet, and kicking you in the balls to purgatory. That would be awesome if St. Peter did that to me. I'd be like, I'll be marking out. The Didact, Halo 4. He's number 55 on the list. What do you think? Travis, have you played Halo 4? I've only played the first Halo game, and I'm going to be honest, I was not impressed. Well, for all the tortured motivations on the list of the evil elite, there's something satisfying about a good old-fashioned space opera lunatic. A galaxy-hopping single-minded psychopath hell-bent on the total global genocide of Earth, and entirely justified in the pursuit that he saw it. The didact managed to trick Master Chief into fleeing <laughs> out an entire science research station, and even a failure took out the population of an entire Earth city. This guy is a fucking nutcase. So we'll go move on now to 54. Killbane, Saints Row the Third. Who's played Saints Row? Nope. I have not. Oh my god, guys. You haven't played any of the games that I like. Okay. Uh, it's not just, that. <laughs> you have Jeff Krupp on the line. I don't have that one's money for games. I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> We've got Jeff Krupp on the line here, so let's bring Jeff Krupp on board as well. Jeff, how's it going, my friend? I'm good. 
We're just going on. We're counting down the hundred greatest villains of all time. So far, the list isn't that great. Um, the, this was actually a list that was chosen by Game Raider staff, believe it or not. Well, I'm reading this list through for you guys. I've I got gameplay and making my own deductions. Well, Kilbane is a masked wrestler that he cheated his way to the top of the Luchador's crime family. He eventually assumes control of the criminals of Cellport and saves the rebellious saints. He tries his best to destroy them while also running a deadly rebellious competition pro wrestling. Um, Kilbane is a damn fine showman too, entering into public and that was operated said wrestling federation. Instead of confronting the saints with some boring shootout, he battles them to brutality in a wrestling match. Okay, so let's see if you guys know this one. Deason, Star Wars Jedi Knights 2, Jedi Outcast, he's at number 53. You guys know this one? I unfortunately do not, and I normally try to keep up on them, so I kind of hate myself right now. <laughs> he's one of the lesser known Dark Jedis in the Star Wars universe, but it doesn't make him any less evil than the Dark Lord of the Sith. Other than the fallen Jedi, he's the main antagonist in Star Wars Jedi Outcast. This then murdered his fellow student of the Jedi Academy in cold blood. Fate murdered Jan Ors, um, and then laid waste to Luke Skywalker's new school of all sensitive with the army of Reborn. Still not convinced that he's a really a bad guy? Well, he gets this. He's got a Tyrannosaurus Rex face for a face. And he's the most evil of dinosaurs. So there you go. Um, okay, here's another one. Ares, God of War. Who knows about God of War? That's me. Go for it. I do. There you go. He can go. <laughs> go on, Jeff. Tell us who Ares is. He's the God of War from Greek mythology and also the main antagonist of God of War. The... Why is he such a, a bad guy? Tell us why he's such a bad guy. Well, he basically tricked Kratos into killing his whole family. That That really would make him a bad guy. So there you go. So number 51 now, we have Akuma from the Street Fighter series. You guys must have played Street Fighter. Get the fuck oh, out yeah. Akuma oh. on this list. Akuma is oh, Tell us why you feel Akuma shouldn't be a bad guy. Well, Akuma is just a boss, man. You know, he is like, he is so hard to play as to get to his ultimate moves and whatnot. I, I get it if he's on the list because of that reason, but other than that, I I would say Evil Ryu is more further up than... Yeah, but he's a cool. murderous... Crim so? He's a he's murderous demon, is what he is. Yeah. Can I just, he's, he's just doing his job. Can I say something? Yes. Um, He killed his brother, for once. There you go. And he basically goes around... Searching for his ultimate opponent, and basically, if you he finds you weak, he kills you. Yeah. Oh, let's be so clear. how can you not call him evil brother? if he kills, goes around killing people just for the hell of it? I think he deserves to be on this list. It's just a hobby. Okay. So let's go to <laughs> fifty now for Vyas, this Gaia, Hour of Darkness. Do you know who he is, Jeff? The evil Vyas is a confident demon and often refers to himself as Dark Adonis. He's a protagonist for Disgaea and has a different name for him mid-boss. He's a nickname in Rage's Vyas, causing him continuously to try and derail Lahari's journey by attacking him every chance that he got. Uh, blaming his loss on cramps and other misfortune injuries, he is the reason that Lahari continues to refuse to acknowledge him as anything other than just an evil little shit. So, here we go for number 49, Donkey Kong. Dace, do you want to take this one? I don't know why everybody's got to hate on the monkey. I don't really see him <laughs> as a bad guy. <laughs> he kidnapped someone. I feel like this is, this is like a very racial, uh, sensitive topic, so I don't want to take this one, considering there's an Italian guy trying to climb ladders and there's a monkey throwing barrels at him. <laughs> it really feels like it's very sensitive, so... I'm going to say, Donkey Kong, you're innocent until proved guilty. <laughs> what about you, Travis? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I have to say something more than that. I think Dave kind of summed it up. Um, no, but, I, yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the big gas gorilla who took um, Mario's then girlfriend, Pauline, just, uh, carried her all the way up on the scaffolding, and, he, yeah. Mario's a player. Like, he had Pauline. Then he had Peach. 
Then he had freaking Toadstool. That, that plumber's got a more talent than Ace. Whoops, I thought that was one and the same. Princess, it was Princess it Toadstool him. that became Peach. No, no, Toadstool and Peach are two different things. Two different Jeez. people. He is a player, man. Should take, I should be taking notes from that guy. No, I, you know, that's why Bowser, Bowser just wanted a piece of ass. And Mario, Mario was like, no. Nope. Mario's got a thing for people in pink. Well, there you go. Same. Okay, um, Vladimir what? Morokov, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 at number 48. So, uh, anybody played the game? Jeff? Yeah, I played it. All right, tell us about Vladimir. Well, basically, he's the guy that basically t- takes over the world. How did you do that, then? Well, from what I remember, he basically came up with a, like, this chemical agent that basically kills everybody that he contacts with. He's an evil fucker. And the gas basically killed everyone that, like, like, everyone that it gets contact with, and when, and he's just a mass genocide killing guy. <laughs> there you go. So, let's go to number 47 now. Gigas, Earthbound. The Mother series. You don't hold the title of Embodiment of Evil without working pretty hard towards your villainy. An alien born to human parents during the early 1900s, Gigas wants to destroy Earth and cast all of reality into darkness, and he attempts to do so by using his evil influence. Every enemy you fight in Earthbound is affected by his powers, turning regular animals like crows or mice into possessed monsters, like the spiteful crows and the rowdy mice as he attempts to prepare the planet for an alien invasion and destruction, lots of destruction. All I need to know is I'm a little kid who goes around killing loads of animals in front of my mother. That's just awesome. Do you know, I want to download that game because unfortunately I don't have the game in my collection and I've never played it. It's on the Wii U at the moment. Do you have a Wii U? I know. Yeah. I, it's not bad. It's actually pretty cheap. Yeah, it's like, what, 10 bucks? And then you also have access to the strategy guide online. What? So I'll, I'll take a look at it. And it's pretty good. All right, the first couple of minutes in the game, I couldn't stop laughing. It's not a kid's game. You know, you have, like, people swearing. There, there's one point where you rescue these two kids and you bring them into the house and the dad literally goes to beat the shit out of them. <laughs> oh, I remember hearing about that. Yeah, I was cracking up with laughter. I was literally, I think I was doing an episode of Geek Speak and I literally had to, like, hold my mouth because I cracked up. Um, so here's another one. Number 46, Clockwork from Sly Cooper. Anyone know this one? No. Nope. There you go. Clockwork is um, basically he's a man who he was a monster that once was a man. So basically jealousy turned him into a monster. In the case of Clockwork, he's a machine. A scheming field stalked the Cooper clan for years, despising them face the infamous reputation that garnered their thieving abilities. His hatred grew so powerful that he eventually replaced his mortal body with that of a mechanical bird. That's fucked up. Okay. Here's one, if you've played the Professor Layton series, Don Poilo from the Professor Layton in the Curious Village. He's a perfect gentleman, always willing to help out anyone in need, and everyone loves him. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. He's nemesis. Don Poilo would see him burn. The criminal mastermind in Layton's mortuary, serving as a foil and opting to live by the code of deception and evil. Though he's always thwarted by Layton's hard work and patience, he is a great foe and one only man capable of going brain to brain with the professor. So if you've got 3DS guys, check this one out. Um, Bill Williamson, Red Dead Redemption. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, go for it, Travis. He was the leader of this gang, and back in the day uh, when John Marston was with this gang, they did a lot. I mean, it's just your typical Western um, plot. Um, this gang is did a lot of bad things and killed so many people. And in this game, in Red Dead Redemption, John Marston was uh, ordered by the U.S. government to seek, out, uh, to seek this guy and bring him to justice, dead or alive. And if he succeeds with his mission, the government will release his uh, wife and his son to him. So right now they're being, ho- being held hostage by the government in order for John to find this guy. There you go. So here's another villain, number 43, Andros from Star Force 64. Yeah! Go for it. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, uh, this is 
evil scientist who was banished um, to this, um, to, oh, Jesus Christ, what's the name of that damn the planet? She's I haven't played in a while. But he was this evil scientist who was, was banished and is taking control over of the lilac. Venom. Oh, no, there we go. It was Venom, the planet, wasn't it? Oh, Venom. That's right. It was Venom. Sorry about that. And he was trying to seize control of the lilac system. So, sorry, um, Fox McCloud and his squadron are trying to uh, save the lilac system from Andros taking over. Can I just say, I was very disappointed with Andros as a final boss. He was too easy to beat. He yeah. really was. He was easy in, in the N64 game and in the original. Let's move on for Andros then, onto the origami killer from Heavy Rain. Who's played Heavy Rain? No. I own it, but I haven't I, played I, it. I played all of two minutes of it, but I know who the killer is, so... I don't want to give any spoilers, so... Talk to us about the origami killer. What does he do? What makes him the origami killer? Uh, well, the story starts off with um, this uh, dude's son goes missing, and um, the dude who kidnaps him leaves a piece of origami behind. And then... This bloke has to find his son with this police officer, and they discover that this origami killer has been killing for, you know, years and whatnot. And um, he just leaves origami behind as his signature piece. There you go, there's the origami killer. We're not going to spoil it for you guys. If you want to check, look back at the I Got Gameplay episode 1, where we actually break down Heavy Rain and talk about the reason why the game is so awesome. That has myself... Uh, uh, Nick Abrams, Sean Mitchell, and also Braden Mayhew, uh, as the four piece were talking about this before. Now, if, uh, number 41 on the list, Psycho Mantis, Metal Gear Solid. Dace, you played Solid? Yes, the, the, he's the shit. Tell us what makes him so villainous, including the whole trick that he does to the, to the system. Oh, uh, yeah, where he fucks up the controller, so all your controllers are now reversed. So oh, when you first come in there, if you're not expecting it, thank God I had a person play it before I got to it, so I know what to do. Um, you'll you'll hit a button, you'll start going on the wrong way. Plus, he's just very meticulous, and he doesn't. God, I can't remember because it's been so long. But doesn't he have someone shoot themselves in the head? Yes. Yeah, Meryl. Meryl. Yeah. So that like Snake's love gets shot in the head, and he is just a complete dick about it the entire time, and he's fucking with your controllers. So to me, I want to be that guy. Because <laughs> he's a little dick. Exactly. Uh, the Grand Theft Auto San Andreas series. Before he was kicking snakes off of planes and assembling Avengers, Samuel Jackson was berating CJ in Grand Theft Auto San Andreas as a corrupt cop whose hobbies include racketeering, corruption, profession, and the use of narcolytics and sexual assaults. He's a foul mouth officer with perpetual pawn in CJ's side throughout the game, showing up times to make his life miserable, and he's also responsible for citywide riots in the later story. This guy is a complete douchebag, and I'm glad he's voiced by Samuel Jackson, who wants to get those motherfucking snakes off of motherfucking planes. <laughs> uh, number 39 is Fall Fall, from Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. Probably no one knows about this one, but we'll talk about him a little bit. Fall Fall dominated the Mario and Luigi series. He's a small, furry-filled being that went into a henchman, the eventual dictator over the course of the series eventually vanquishing the Mario Brothers and <laughs> Mushroom Kingdom and Bowser Castle. And he's captured our hearts with unforgettable quotes like, you inhaled like a hungry syrup pig at the free pancake buffet. And your lives that I spit on are now caricatures of a cartoon drawn by a kid who is stupid. Again, Dace, there's another character mirrored after you. Right, um, so we go to number 38, Yeti from Ski Free. Think back to 91 at a time when people were neon-coloured, wine suit, listened to Paul Abdul, ironically, and an era which using the internet meant you were a hardcore techie. Familiar with news groups and every PC game and told stories around the campfire, how they almost escaped that fucking Yeti in Ski Free. He was always lurking just beyond the site and waiting for you to pull your stick up and jump so he could gobble you up and ruin your score. Worst of all, he always did, even when you knew what, that he was coming. Oh. Absolute prick. Yeah, number 37, Ansem in Kingdom Hearts. Okay, who's a Kingdom Hearts buffet? 
not okay. I've, sure. I've played, but I I'm not. We not need well. Dave and Mayhew here to talk about this one. Yeah. Anthem is the creation of confusing and typical Kingdom Hearts style. His evil intent is crystal clear. He kidnaps the princess to unlock the door to the Kingdom Hearts, which will grant him the power to plunge the universe into darkness. First, Anthem possessed pretty boy Riku to do his dirty work, but he eventually amassed enough power to take on Mickey Mouse one-on-one. Even after his defeat, his evil lingers in both Riku and various time travel plots, securing him as a continual annoyance to the saps living in many of the Disney worlds. Okay. The Darkness, Paulie Frechetti. He's number 36. Anybody played the Darkness game? They would know that Paulie Frechetti is the guy that kills the Darkness love of his life. Um, oh, Anita's favorite bloke. Yeah, he literally, he was a police chief edge of They kidnapped Jenny Romano uh, and brutally executed her in front of Jackie while he helplessly watched on. What a douchebag. So we go on to number 35, Pope Rodrigo Borgia, Assassin's Creed 2. Anyone played Assassin's Creed 2? I played some um, of it, but not a whole way through it. Okay, Pope Borgia is a real figure in history, and his son, Caesar, who's featured in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, though we doubt he kept the secret star map under the Vatican. While Ciziri is more mentally unstable in the pair, Rodrigo was most cunning in Assassin's Creed 2. He busts Ezio's handsome chops by nabbing the Apple of Eden and manipulating several plots from behind the scenes to keep the assassins busy. He's a typical fat cat, manipulative, political of a villain, which makes the scene at the end where you punch his chubby face all the more satisfying. 34. Purple Tentacle from Day of the Tentacle. Come on, guys, you must have played this game. No? No. Game. I have not. The, the only thing I can reckon, um, you know, back in my mind, with the Day of the Tentacles, Zombies, man. <laughs> How can you not love the Purple Tentacle? He's the main menace in Day of the Tentacle, and his venom was born with evil intentions and a unibrow. He was a little else going for it and decides that it wants to take over the world. With lofty ambitions, the tentacle flaps to her arms and sends its creator to the mad scientist Dr. Fred Edison and his friends to chase him to stop the bizarre creation from wreaking havoc on everything it touches. It was an awesome game. I love this. Okay, Calypso, Twisted Metal 2 is at number 33. Who's played Twisted Metal? I have. He was a great villain. He was awesome. Talk to us about dice. The, the one thing I love about Twisted Metal 2 was the stories that came with the, each character, and by the time you got to it, they would plan out like what they did with their winnings, and he would always turn a phrase on it and make it, like, fucked up. Like, <laughs> one guy, I remember one guy, I think it was um, Spectre, wanted his face to be seen around the world, so Calypso stretched it across the globe so everybody would see his face. Oh. So he would play on words and do, like, these vicious shit at the end of Twisted Metal 2. Um, and I was excited when Twisted Metal 3, he was going to become a playable character, which kind of flopped. But Twisted Metal 2 is one of my all-time favorite games, and he was an awesome villain. Okay, we're going to number 32, The Fog, Shin Megami Tensei, and Persona 4. Let's just turn on the television. Well, that's weird. That's our best friend dancing around the TV and singing the city song. Odd. We'll ask him about it tomorrow, and, huh, he's not in school today. Oh, he's dead, and his body's hanging from an antenna. And the fog is to blame. Oh, that's wonderful. Better grab a sword and jump into the TV and beat the demons. Because it's Persona 4, and that's apparently what's going on. So there you go. This fog goes and kills people. I'm probably going to get Sean berating me after this, because Sean Mitchell was a huge Persona 4 fan. Right, Lavos from Chrono Trigger is at 31. Lavos is basically the ultimate evil incarnate of the universe. He devours the world and the terror of every planet he encounters. He landed the Earth in the year 65,000 BC with the intention of cultivating the planet and the vast population of life, just so he could suck everything up into a version of a highly notorious protein shake. And when he's done, he moves on to another planet. Starts to cycle over and over again. So there you go. That's the reason why he's the bad guy in this one. So number 30, Dr. Fatus, Super Meat Boy. Anybody play Super Meat Boy? Yo! Go for it, Sean. Finally! Yes! Super Meat Boy. Uh, Dr. Fetus is a baby in a in a suit, and um, <laughs> he he kidnaps um, Super Meat Boy's um, missus in the beginning of the game, and then you got to go through all these painful levels trying to 
get to your missus. It's it's like Donkey Kong, um, Mario vs. Donkey Kong, um, in that aspect, where you gotta go and get your girl, and then Dr. Fetus punches you in the face and legs it with your missus, and he keeps abusing Mrs. Meat Boy. I think that's the name. I don't know. I can't remember. But all I know is Dr. Fetus, what a guy. He was so funny. He was, he was great. Well, here's one I think you guys are going to love. Dr. Wily is at number 29 from the Mega Man franchise. Who wants to touch on Dr. Wily? No one? Seriously? No. Um, okay, um, I mean, I'm a crazy scientist who was bent on uh, ruling the world. Of course! <laughs> and <laughs> We need that. We need that soundbite. I think I'm going to go uh, let off this show. I'm going to find, of course! Yeah, it's only you know, just queued up when someone says, taking over the world. But anyway, of course. <laughs> and he just he you know, creates all these robots to try to fulfill it in his desire to take over the world. Of course. There you go. <laughs> okay, number twenty eight, Doctor Robotnik, aka Doctor Eggman. No. No oh. you <laughs> Doctor Eggman and Doctor Robotnik are not the same people. I don't okay. care what anybody says. Okay, Sean, tell us. Doctor Dr. Robotnik is a legend. In, in gaming history, Dr. Eggman is, I don't know, a taller, skinnier, crappier version of what is one of the greatest bad guys of all time. He kidnaps Sonic's friends and puts them in fucking capsules at the end of the level. It's like, no, Dr. Dr. Eggman and Dr. Robotnik aren't the same people. I refuse to accept that. Okay. Um, number two, I refuse. Dr. And he should be high up on the list. Whoever did this list. Of life two. <laughs> does that no shit. I remember guys, if you wanna basically talk about the names on this list, seven six zero five one two seven two four seven at seven six zero five one two seven two four seven. Doctor Bean, Half Life Two. Anybody played Half Life Two? Nope. Doctor Robotnik should be higher than this dude. <laughs> Doctor Bean is the most hated of all time villains and spinous collaborators, selfish to the ultimate degree. He's more than happy to sell out his entire world if it means a relative degree. Of safety for his oppressors. Smug while others suffer, he places privilege and his own for nothing but cowardice, unpleasant self righteous and presenting a desperate self preservation right until his presumed end. So there we go, that's Dr. Bean from Half Life 2. Okay. Dormeen, Shadow of the Colossus, is at number 26. He's a disembodied voice who similarly speaks to the male and female voice, a house that's actually a great big temple full of scary statues and a power to reverse death. Dormin is one heck of a creepy villain and one that you only realise at first if only you thought about it the evil would plain to see why would anyone nice insist that you kill a bunch of colossus first two words ulterior motive there we go on that one number 25 Kane from Command and Conquer anyone played that game? he's got a thirdly high IQ and apparent immortality check the power of the rule over the brotherhood of Nod and the Iron Fist whilst intensely exuding the charm and charisma that only a bald-headed man, like myself, of course, is capable of. Check with the capital of C. Kane has terrorised the world and countries a number of times from the 19th century all the way to the 21st. He has no qualms about executing his minions if they fail to respect his authority. Ah. 24. Shao Kahn. Mortal Kombat. Who wants to put their two cents on this guy? Oh! Go on, Jeff. Shao Kahn. Well, he used to be the visor under the first Netherworld, um, king, the Dragon King, Anaga, but greed for more power, he kills Anaga just to take the throne. And basically, to keep the throne, he goes to Internia, or I think that's what it's called, and kills the king, and brainwashes the queen. Sindel and Princess Katana into being his, like, wife and daughter to keep the portals open to other dimensions. And basically, he uses his minions to kill other dimensions warriors to, like, every dimension he conquers, he basically expands his world into theirs. Well, as you know, guys... We've got the the show. If you call in on seven six zero five one two seven two four seven, we have ten minutes left. We may do a little bit of overtime if this list keeps going. So we've got now on twenty three, Mister Mecha Hitler 
from Wolfenstein. So, anybody played Wolfenstein before? No, but I can't see why Hitler is at number one. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, number 22. (laughs) Joker, Batman Arkham series. Blasphemy should be a little bit higher. He should be. I agree with you on that one. I concur. Well, I agree. Oh, is and the Joker in that game the, like the one from the like? Are they talking about the comic with the game, or are they talking about the animated series Joker? Okay, we've got um, someone on the line called. Oh no, they're gone. Okay, that was weird. <laughs> we had someone on the line, and he went. Um, well, that I have no idea what that happened. I don't know if that was blog talk. Apologies, uh, BZ Alchemist. If you want to call in again, you can do um, to quickly chat with us. We're still on the line for 10 minutes, 7605127247, and you can also basically chat with us on the Skype. So let's go for number 21, Porky Mints from Mother 3. Take Star Fox Eric Cartman, give him limited power, and take him away from the sense of humor. You have something that resembles Mother 3's Porky Mints. After nearly destroying everything in Earthbound, he travels to the quaint Tasmil village and starts messing things there. First, he creates hybrid robot animal monstrosities, sends them to attack civilians, and because that makes him cooler. Next, he sucks every ounce of innocence from Tasmili because he thinks it's boring. His master plan through involves awakening the almighty dragon and forcing it to destroy the entire planet. He is a douchebag on the end. Okay, um, next one is Kerrigan from StarCraft 2 at number 20. She is an absolute badass and one of the most badass villains of all time. The entire franchise, more or less, is surrounded by Kerrigan. So for Anita giving the life, this is your powerful woman. She runs the entire brood. Get your shit straight. This is ter- she is the shit. She, to me, she would be top three. Hands down, she is the best villain I have ever seen. Okay, we've got here now Imran Zakib from Modern Warfare, number 19. He's been fighting two for now to bring the free world to its knees for his entire life, and he eventually fails. But it's not before he secures his place as one of the most detested foes of all time. In a brief scene, we still remember the seething hatred we felt for him as he walked up to the top of the Allies, emotionally executing each of them past the gun. Remember thinking, side it over, and then there it is. The chance never before do we feel so satisfied ending his digital life. Okay, Alma from Fear 2 is at number 18. You guys played Fear? Nope. I've heard about her. Alma is a creepy um, as hell. She's from the original Fear. By the time we got to the sequel, she packed up a scary little visage in favor of a scary adult girl vibe. And while this alone is pretty unnerving, in reality her actions are placed so high on this list is at the end of Fear 2, the main character is locked in a chair and she appears that she forces him into a hallucination where she rapes the main character. Spooky. Number 17, Dracula from Castlevania. Who wants to hit this one? He never played the series. Whoa, really? I'm surprised. Go on, Travis. Uh, well, obviously Dracula and Castlevania go together like peanut butter and jelly because... Um, the main protagonist of the whole franchise has been this vampire who has this, ma- this majest- oh, it's not the wrong word. It's this castle that he lives in and it's always changing every game. And his, his ultimate goal is to wipe out the Belmont clan who, through the generations, have always succeeded in defeating him and he's always come back every 100 years. To to enslave mankind and try to t- take over the world. <laughs> Number 16 now, we've got Pyramid Head from the Silent Hill franchise. Who wants to tag on this one? Anybody? No? What's him of it again? Uh, Pyramid Head from Silent Hill. Uh, no, I can't tell you. Silent Hill 2 is ultimately the introspective journey of fighting personal demons. You have much more real threat in Pyramid Head. He appears sporadically throughout the game, brutalizing anything in front of him, and silently stalks the hallways of Silent Hill, equipped with just spear, perplexing headgear, and a seemingly unending force tube. Pyramid Head looks so creepy as anything in a game, he has the power to back it up with his threatening looks. He's nasty. He took one of the like the, the female body corpses in the game and literally just tore them apart with his bare hands. He's that nasty. 
Um, okay, number 15, Shadow System Sock. System Shock Sock. System Shock 2. Long before GLaDOS existed, Shodan was a feminine AI to fear. Her ever-watchful presence in Von Braun's spaceship when you had nowhere to hide, and she had a similar penchant for making you her personal laptop between scathing taunts. But what makes Shodan an exception to her relation to the player? You created her, and she's still plotting to kill you during times of reluctant alliance. Ooh, she is a scary one. Number 14, The Elusive Man, Mass Effect 2. He's an age where racism and xenophobia are still sadly issues and rear their head on a daily basis. Mass Effect's elusive man is a thoroughly modern villain from the thoroughly machine guns, baby seals dressed as Hitler. His own way, he has the best interest in humanity at heart, although ending the Mass Effect free paints him as the bad guy. You have the option to side with him throughout most of the game and the villain that holds up a mirror to your own morals. We like that a lot. He's a rather appealing villain. Number 13, Albert Wesker, Resident Evil series. Who wants to touch on him? Albert Wesker is a cool ginger, man. Well, talk about him. He's, he owns the Umbrella Corporation. And um, he, is a, he is a very nice man. <laughs> he, he created the T-Virus. I, I can't remember why. Um, but, yeah. He, he takes a rocket launcher to the face in Resident Evil 4, which is only a good thing. Oh, well, what about uh, number 12 here? Handsome Jack, Borderlands 2. Who's played Borderlands 2? No, no. I've, I've played, like, an hour and a half of it. Handsome Jack is a classic villain, well-spoken, intelligent, even charming in a way, but there's no mistake in that he's utterly evil with it. He thinks nothing but killing people, animals. Brilliantly, he lives in a Death Star-style satellite in shape of a H, which stands for the beloved Hyperion Corporation, which is always visible to the sky, especially when it's firing lasers down onto the planet's surface. Told you he was a classic villain, but yeah, he's got to die. Number 11, M. Bison. Who wants to talk about Bison? Badass. <laughs> Go on, Jeff. Well, he basically, like, he had picked it, he used psychic powers to basically pick himself up to the most maximum form and he can basically kill anything except for Akuma. Because Akuma beat him. <laughs> right. Let's go. And he wants to take over the world. And he wants to take yeah. over the world. Of course. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Let's go on to uh, number ten, our top ten now, which is Vast Montegro from Far Cry 3. Um, basically, he's... How, how can I say this without sounding like a total douchebag? But I probably will have to say it. Um, Vass is a real star of Fire Cry 3 as he plays instantly which can flip between harmless rambling to cold-blooded murderer in a heartbeat. He makes him the most memorable character in the game and one of the best villains of the console generation even though he inflicts some truly horrific acts to the inhabitants of the island. You can't help but relish in every account with Vass as he oozes charisma from every pore. By that arm. And then at the end of Metal Gear Solid 4, we see basically it was just that uh, Liquid Ocelot just went crazy. And that's why he thinks that he was Liquid Snake. Ladies and gents, we're experiencing a couple of problems on Blog Talk Radio, so I'm hoping we're not lagging too much. Do apologize. We would ask you to call in, but you can't now because we're recording the rest of the show. <laughs> but you can check us back on the archives. Um, right, now we've got number six, Seraph from Final Fantasy VII. Jeff, take the stage. Well, he was once a good guy, but in the Shinran army. But then he finds out his mother was an alien, and it basically drives him insane. And he wants to destroy the world because the government was using his mother as test subjects and stuff. He became insane. There you go. He's a complete and utter nutcase. Um, he's also one of those evil guys that you just love so much that you really wanted to play. I really wanted to play Seraph as a playable character in Final Fantasy VII. Couldn't do it, though. It's number five. Arcos. To, yeah, go on, Jeff. Not to mention he had one of the badass themes of all time. <laughs> exactly. Uh, number five. Arthas Menethil. Warcraft Three, World of Warcraft. 
One of the things that makes Arthas Menafor such a compelling villain is that he used to be a righteous hero, one we watched fall into madness. Raised in the paladin of Lord Arian, he sworn to protect citizens in his kingdom, but he was so loyal to his vows that he would risk anything, even his own humanity, to do so. That's why he took up the cursed Rune Sword and Frostmoor and consumed him, eventually turning him into the greatest force of evil of Azeroth had ever known. The dark days began, and once he slew his own father, turned Lord Dorian into the undead, infested land of evil, eventually became the new Lich King, gaining unfathomable power, which he raised a terrible army of ghouls, demons, and corrupted souls. Thousands were killed and soul-consuming swords, millions more under his feared banner of death. Once beloved champion, Arthas left only destruction in his wake. I think he shouldn't be high on this list, but there we go. Number four, Bowser. You're kidding me. Four? Fucking bullshit. That's... <laughs> you got to okay. be kidding me. Who wants to talk about Bowser? Chuck? What's not to say? I mean, he's the reason why we have... Mostly we... He's mostly the reason why we have villains in video games. He's he's literally the, the biggest antagonist in the Mario series ever. A man who... He, you know what? You have to give him the try. But he always is defeated, and he's probably because he was a long-term villain. But I wouldn't see him that high on the list. Number three, GLaDOS. Portal. What? No, I don't Ooh. know. Basically, Portal, with the lesser than who was being about being locked in a room with an unpredictable lunatic, GLaDOS is a scary, quietly murderous proposition in and herself, but Portal Salp was deranged computer being the player's only means of understanding and dealing with her was basically, you know, taking orders from her. And with GLaDOS in charge, she's navigating arbitrary sciences like being a child with a lunatic mother. There's unpredictability and threat, but also intimacy and a sense of mutual reliance that makes the player's relationship with GLaDOS far more uncomfortable than if she were a mere homicidal lunatic bent on world domination. If you survive her, or will you kill her? Will you escape her? But don't feel the slightest bit surprised if you find yourself mourning her a little afterwards as well. And here's a spoiler for you. The cake is a lie. <laughs> Number two, Kefka, Final Fantasy VI. Really? you got to be kidding me. Who the hell put this list together? Kefka is the most beautifully realized nuance of a killer. A flat-out terrifying villain and the entire history of the Final Fantasy saga. He must not be genetically modified, single-minded, super soldier, an omnipotent sorcerer capable of bending time and space to his will. And exactly why was he so scary? Kefka was a big bundle of psychosis and a very human frailties who clawed together every last scrap of ultimately apocalyptic power he gained through his own desperate rage. Okay, mm, I don't see it. Number one, Ganondorf, the Legend of Zelda series. I was about to see where the fuck was Ganondorf. <laughs> Do you guys... Okay. Um, Travis, take it. <laughs> um, first of all, whoever put this list together, I want to spit on your face, uh, spit in your face, because that was absolutely redundant. <laughs> but anyway, Skinador, the main villain of the whole Zelda series. I mean, you cannot have a Zelda game without Ganondorf in some form. He is a, ma a maniacal wizard. I think that's the best way to, put it, to say it. Who is bent on trying to rule the innocent people of Hyrule? And he does this by sending out his minions to try to uh, ins um, keep everything in, in, in his order. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it's Ganondorf. Come on. you got to play Zelda to know what Ganondorf is. It's, everybody plays a Zelda game at some point. Come on. Okay, um, going on that now, let's go to our host and find out everybody's, um, th let's do a top five for everyone, so we'll start off with you, Travis, your top five evil villains. Okay, well, um, I'm just going to go with one through five. One, Bowser, of course. Two, Ganondorf. Three, here's one that didn't make the list, the ghosts of, from Pac-Man. Yeah, they, they were pretty good villains. Yeah. Uh, number four, uh, I'm going with Skull Monkeys on this one. It was, um, oh, god damn, what was his name? I haven't played the game in a long time. It's one of my favorite video games. Claw, Claw Monkey. <laughs> and number five, it's a, it's a, uh, some five favorites. 
you know, I'm just going to have to say the Joker. I mean, yeah, I know that he's a comic book character, but you know what? He makes a damn fine villain in video games. And Hammer was awesome as a Joker. Oh, oh by the way, uh, uh, tying in number five would be Harley Quinn because I have a mad crush on her. Oh, yeah. I, literally, if any girl wanted to... I'm telling you now, if you want to date Michael Burhan, dress up as Harley Quinn, I'm yours. Okay. All right. <laughs> that, that's all I'm saying. Damn. Ow. Exactly. Oh. Walker, you're up next to bat. Give me, me a top five. My, my top five? Um, number five, Giovanni from um, Pokemon. Because he's the leader of Team Rocket, and I've said. Number four, Shredder from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Good one. Uh, number three, Venom from the Spider-Man series. Very good one, actually. He's a very number good anti hero as well. Number two, Bowser. Uh, number one, Ganondorf. So they actually got something right on this list with their number one bad guy. But, come on. Really? Dr. Robotnik, number 27? <laughs> Like I, said before, like I said to you when we were doing the comments, he should have been in the top five, and I kind of regret not putting him up there, but definitely he is in my top ten. Okay, uh, Chris Dice. Okay, coming in at number one is Dr. Neo Cortex. Number two is Dr. Engin. Number three is Dr. Nitrous Brio. Number four is Tiny Tiger, and number five is Ripper Roo. Bring back Crash Bandicoot, damn it. Bring it back. <laughs> Somehow I am not surprised by that list. Jeff Fruit. Number five, I would have to say Akuma. Okay. Number four, Shao Kahn. That's a good choice. Mm -hmm. Number three, M. Bison. Number two, I would have to say Robotnik. Excellent. And then number one, I would have to say, hmm, let me think on this. Sephiroth. You love Sephiroth. I love Sephiroth as well. He's a badass. I mean, he basically um almost destroyed the world twice. I mean, how can you not put him in number one for doing that? <laughs> exactly. And he also put his sword through a bitch. You see, what was his name? What was, what was that bitch's name? Aerith. That was it. She was pissing him off so much he stuck a sword through her and no one batted an eyelid. And he also did it while she was praying. There you go. See that? Yeah, Anita Sarkeesian. There you go. Sephiroth. Yeah, Sephiroth was the one he put a sword through the bitch while she was praying. <clears throat> Think about the fact that she sacrificed a woman. Um, the fact that he put a sword through a woman and that she actually was the thing that ultimately saved the world, her spirit. But you're, you're not going to touch on that, are you? You're just going to talk about the fact that he put his soul through her, you bitch. Anyway. <laughs> but the only bad part about Eric was that her death made Cloud so emo. Yeah. There's, there's, um, if anybody wants to check out, there's a series of cartoons by Igaraptor called The Awesome Series. And there's a bit where you've got Cloud and the other guy. What was the, the other one? Um, the Zach. Yeah, that was it. And they're standing there going, oh, my God. My life sucks, I hurt, it hurt so much, and they're trying to, like, slit each other's wrists. And it was just so funny, because it's getting all emo, it's hilarious. I'm going to find this bit for the rest of you guys. You know what's funny, though? Eric was actually Zach's girlfriend before she was Cloud's girlfriend. My God, that girl was a hoe, no wonder she got stabbed. <laughs> and Cloud's is actually a clone of Zach and Sephiroth. <laughs> Do you know what it is? She probably, right, she was probably giving Sephiroth head as well. And he was like, no, bitch, you're not leaving me. And he just cut her one. So she, he basically did the vicious thing. <laughs> so you got Sephiroth, pimp before pimp. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys my top five now. Number five, I would actually go for Bowser for the Mario series of games. Number four, Ganondorf. I know a lot of you Zelda heads are going to kill me for that one. Number mm. three, Nook <laughs> from the Animal Crossing series. Number two, Rook. Number two, what would I put? Oh, that was it. Superman from Injustice, Gods Among Us. Because Good choice. Good he choice. Put his fucking fist through the Joker's chest. Come on. Hello. Yeah, he lost everything and went completely and utterly psycho. Not to mention he killed Captain Marvel too. There you go as well. He he literally looked into the guy's eyes and just 
fucking lasered the things into the core of his brain. That's just nasty. And number one, for me, doesn't have to be for everybody else, number one for me would have to be the one and the only, and that's basically if you if you turn evil, Corvo from the Dishonored series. That's evil Corvo if you choose the dark side. I did. I chose the dark side. From the Dishonored series. He was an interesting character, a man who lost everything and still turned dark. It was brilliant. So there you go, guys. If you've got a top five, leave us a top five on the Facebook.com. I got gameplay. Facebook.com, Fanboys Anonymous. Or Facebook.com, Mega Powers Radio. And we'll check your top fives up. Do you agree or disagree? Leave us a comment. You can also email us on a Gmail. I don't. I got game. Ugh, I got gameplay. There we go. Mouthful. I got gameplay at gmail dot com, um, and basically specify if you agree or disagree with us. Now, guys, let's go on to that list quickly. What did you think of it, and why do you think that it sucked eggs? Fucking AGN's list was that. I mean, fucking hell, man. Who the fuck are these people? <laughs> I mean, I've never been near to this company. Who was, who was it again? Game Readers. I chose this list because I wanted to basically do a nice little 100 list of the 100 most beneficial villains in gaming. And so, and mm, technically they did some good ones, but they've left a lot of guys out. You think? Yeah. In a fucking no, shredder, man. What about you, no, uh, Dace? Uh, it was the travesty that Neocortex was up in, like, the 90s, I'm just saying. So, <laughs> this just, was absolute right. shit. Travis, what about you? That was the most pathetic list I have ever, I've ever heard, because, I mean, they, they, they did name a lot of the, like, more popular ones, but they were so far down in the list. I mean, and they had, like, the newer ones. I mean, I wonder who put this together, some 15-year-old who just had, like, maybe... A little bit of gaming knowledge, but this was pathetic. I'm sorry. Well, then I'll have to say to game readers in that list, I give you this. Couldn't have said it better myself. So what about you, Jeff? What did you think of that list? Well, I just don't get, like, how they could put some of those characters higher up than others. I mean, Robotnik didn't deserve to be 27. You think he should have been higher? Yeah, I mean, come on, I mean, the guy turned Sonic's friends into robotic animals. And in order to, for Sonic to, to basically free him, he had to basically kill him. <laughs> or kill the robot, or bounce on him and turn him back into regular animals again. Very much so. So there you go, guys, that's pretty much us for our um, top 100 villains. Um, how, what's your top five list? Who are the villains that you think should have actually been on this list, and who do you think were the most appealing of these villains? You know, why why do you think villains are so appealing? Why do you feel that as a gamer, a villain draws you in? I think for us, and I think the general consensus is, villains are the people that hold those stories together. They're the maniacal end to the story. So they're the biggest boss that you have to get so you can save that damsel in distress or even the main antagonist in the game that you can defeat to eventually save the world. Yes, villains are well needed. Villains are the core of gaming and villains are the biggest things that you will ever have in gaming. Some are looked upon as awesome because of their motives. Others are just complete and utter badasses like Seraph and also like Mr. Christopher Dace. They're just the greatest things that actually created the character, like Dr. <laughs> Neo Corset. <laughs> so there you go, guys, and that's our list. And as again, if you want to catch us out, we'll just go into our plugs and let each person talk about what they're doing um, this week and also the next week. So we'll start with you, Chris Dace. Tell us a bit more about you. Hey! You can follow me on Twitter, at the Dace Man. I like to uh, tweet and talk to people. Fun. I like to get more followers. Uh, you can catch me starting September 7th at Old Time Wrestling. You can catch us at oldtimewrestling.net. We'll be doing shows every Saturday starting then. And you can always hear me here on Mega Powers Radio with the Dace Man Show Wednesdays at 8 with Michael Burhan, who's on it a lot, which is awesome. And, of course, <laughs> Gibby and Mr. Payton. Uh, so that's all I got. Okay, uh, go with you, Jeff. 
Plug away. Well, I got a YouTube channel, and that's, the name is Legendary Brawly, where I would be doing anime reviews. But I guess I should save that for the anime show that I will be doing the 25th. Since that's basically an anime show. <laughs> and I also got a Facebook um, page where uh, it's just Group 1 and or Jeff Group. You just look under, under my name and find me there. You can also find him also with um, on the Nerd Genius page. i got Gameplay and also on Medical Powers Radio. And uh, if you want to go through, find him through myself, facebook.com, for slash Michael Burhan. And obviously I would point you into Jeff's direction. And Jeff has an anime show on the 25th of August at 8pm on Sunday night on Mega Powers Radio. And we're hopefully, this is going to be the pilot here to see if this show is going to work on this platform. And if it does, uh, we want a lot of callers. We want a lot of you guys phoning in, telling us what you think of the certain animes and you know Jeff's going to be doing a great job I'll be there as well guest hosting with him to help the show get on the road uh, as well as other uh, Mega Powers hosts who are going to help Jeff get this show up and running um, Travis you're next what you got for us okay um, you can follow me on Twitter um, at TravisGoth79 I also have a Facebook, I mean, yeah I've got Facebook as well just look me up with Travis Goth and easy way to find me is and don't ask me how this happened. It's uh, facebook.com slash travisgoss3. I don't know how the three got there. And I have YouTube. Uh, I have a YouTube channel as well. And I know I'm a pre- it's, uh, you can find me under Travis Goss. As, you know. And I know I promised last week I was going to have Keystone Capers up uh, this past week. Unfortunately, I had some technical problems, so I'm going to have to... Uh, work around it. I have to basically re record the episode and then all that. But I've got that coming up and on the market for some uh video software. If you guys could uh recommend any cheap video software I could find, I'd like to use that because I want to do some really good videos and and uh reviews in the near future. But I'm working on Keystone Capers as we speak. Okay, Sean. Uh, ch- check my shit out on um, fanboysanonymous.com and follow me on Twitter at shaunacy2k37 follow me on my YouTube channel which is shaunacy1989 um, I haven't got um, anything up recently because I've been playing DC Universe All right. <laughs> and um, yeah I just shared my own voice and um, yeah that's put me off and um, <laughs> what, what was I going to say uh, yes I'm going to also go on this Game Raider site to see if they've done a top 100 hero list and if not, I'm going to send them a death threat. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Check my shit out. Just before I did that, do apologise, guys. I was on Twitter, and for some reason, the video popped up. Um, but, yeah, so check out Sean Hennessy, uh, 1989, on uh, Twitter. Is it 2K7's on Twitter? 2K3's on Twitter. 1989 is on YouTube. on YouTube. He does some awesome Pokemon videos, guys. He literally, they are fucking hilarious. And I'm still waiting for more updates, but he's not posting anything as of yet. I haven't got a life, man. I've been playing DC Universe online. Yeah, but you need to get back to doing your videos so I can I listen and laugh. They I've just, lost all my data, though. They get me through life, man. Come on. Um, also, you can check us out on www.fanboysanonymous.com uh, because basically it's the one place for nerds and Everything nerd like. You can also check me out on www.youtube.com forward slash the nerd genius. And also a new show that I'm starring in with Brandon Legan, Eleanor Sanders, um, and we're going to be having Nikki Mills guesting on episode two called This Job for Hire. And I'm hopefully going to try and find roles for everybody on Fanboys Anonymous to actually guest on the show voice wise because I want to include everyone on this show. Um, but check that out guys support it support your local independent wrestling support your local independent gaming support independence everywhere including YouTube and please 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 if you like what I do here subscribe to my YouTube channel because the more subs I get the better Um, and that's pretty much it guys and remember as I said before we've got gameplay have you?